thousand books in print I was reading somewhere um, about Atlantis and, and these civilizations, of, of advanced civilizations, which existed in what is to conventional history, prehistory. And these civilizations were destroyed by vast cataclysmic events, which you can see uh, recorded in the ancient texts and verbal histories of every single ancient culture. Of course, the famous one in the Bible is the Great Flood and all that stuff, but that is um, mirrored in uh, ancient cultures all over the world, this great cataclysmic um, period of geological and uh, upheavals and if you and volcanic upheavals and if you uh, there's a very good book called um, "When the Earth Nearly Died" or "The Day the Earth Nearly Died," where the researchers have looked at the myths or what we call myths of all these uh, stories around the world of the great cataclysmic events, and then they've looked at the biological and geological evidence to see if it supports the stories in the myths. And it does, very, very compellingly. And, um, of course, like I say, Noah uh, and the biblical story of the great flood is the most famous one but you take that back to its origin or at least one of its origins and you go back into ancient Sumer long before where the same story was told but it's told um, everywhere now 98% of what I'm talking about today is come from hard research where it hasn't, I'll tell you. And I'd got to a certain point um, of taking this back from the physical to trying to get an understanding of what was behind these cataclysmic events and actually what's behind this crazy world, which at one time was not crazy. Probably not that long ago uh, was not crazy. Again, one of the other common themes is that before the cataclysmic events, there was a, what, what is often referred to as a golden age of great harmony and a great abundance when it was almost like a utopian world. And then the cataclysmic events came and everything changed. And I was in um, America um, at a place called Sedona in Arizona about... Uh, two months ago, well, maybe less than that, anyway, not that it matters, um, and I went into this, should we say, other state of consciousness. For many, many years, I've been going into coma-like states where I, it's just like unbelievably deep, and sometimes it takes a half an hour, 45 minutes to come out of them very, very slowly. But what suddenly happened in the last few weeks since the turn of the year is I'm going into these deep states, but I'm holding consciousness when I go there. And, and what, what happened to me as I went into one of these states just a few weeks ago, I never talked about this before, funnily enough, um, and this kind of voice started talking to me about what the cataclysmic events were all about and what this situation in the world is all about. And I can only give it you and take it as you will. And what it was was that at one point, well, actually, not just at one point, but up to the point where these cataclysmic events happened, this, the energy field of this earth and further out was extremely harmonious, extremely balanced, vibrating in a very balanced, harmonious way. And this manifested down to the physical, into the decoded world, as a balanced, loving abundant, sharing, caring society, which was vastly, vastly different to the way it is now. And what I was then shown, and what the voice referred to as the schism happened, and what I saw, I found this picture on the internet, which kind of gives a feel for it, what I saw as this voice was talking about the schism was a harmonious energy field 
And then through the center of it went this bright blue, like electrical charge, almost like lightning. And everything started vibrating in a chaotic way. Um, and it called it the schism. And as this manifested down through the uh, vibrational into the decoded world, it manifested itself as a physical version of this schism, which was massive um, geological events, which not only transformed this reality or this part of this reality physically in the way that's recorded by the ancients and through to the present day, but it fundamentally changed this reality mentally and emotionally because suddenly we were living in a chaotic energy environment which was being decoded through the, into the physical and so, suddenly the chaos and conflict of the schism was manifesting itself as chaotic um, and conflict and all the rest of it that started to come into the world. And uh, the, the schism is what has created the schism within human society that wasn't there before. And as I'll get to in the third section today, there's increasing evidence that this schism, indeed this voice went on to say, this schism is now in the process of being corrected. And the other thing this voice said was, people need to understand in relation to this, that every single thing is conscious. Some things more conscious than others, but everything has a consciousness. And in, in fact, the phrase it used was, was everything has a self-awareness, everything has a self-identity. And it was saying that this schism has a self-identity. It's consciousness. So it has a self-identity. And its self-identity is one of um, what we would call evil, but what in real terms is fundamental imbalance. Loss of harmony, loss of connection to the, what we would call in the first uh, part of this presentation, heart consciousness. And so um, this energetic imbalance has become holographic imbalance in the way that it's decoded. Another interesting thing is that, um, again, I'll come to this part again in the last section with something else, but... Before the schism, the energy in this reality was so harmonious, so in tune with, with the human form, and so much more powerful that we didn't eat food. We lived off the energy, everything. Because what is food? It's just holographic energy. That's what it is and we consume food, we're consuming energy. We used to live off the energy. Some people, even, even today, oh, it's very, very difficult today because of the energy environment compared with what it was, still um, live off what they call prana. They live off energy. They don't eat food. Um, and what I come to understand is that when this energy changed and our ability to um, get sustenance from energy without food changed, we needed to bridge that gap. We needed to bridge that difference between the energy as was and the energy um, that uh, replaced it in a much less powerful way and to bridge that gap for the energy requirements of the body computer was to eat food. This also applied to what we call the animal kingdom. What it was saying was, before, there was no law of the wild. That's not how it was meant to be. You know, we live on a planet that's a bloody killing field. Everything is killing everything else and living off the demise of everything else. And, and, and crucial to that is the need for the predator to eat the predated. 
And so you have this conflict, this fear, where, the, again, adding massively to the fear as an uh, expression of this schism energy, you've got animals all the time, and humans come to that too, but animals f- all day are in fear of predators. It's a constant ex- uh, experience of fear. And what it was saying was, although the Bible talks about the wolf laying down with the lamb, a lot of people talk about the lion laying down with the lamb. The, the point is, when there was no need to eat food and therefore be a predator, there was no conflict, there was no fear, and everything was in harmony. I know it's very difficult to get the mind around that, given what we're experiencing today, but if you think of harmonious energetic environment and then a very different one, um, the two express themselves physically, as they always do, um, in the society that we live in. So when these great cataclysmic events were taking place, um, people of advanced knowledge started to move before and um, after into other parts of the world. And they took with them this advanced knowledge. And as the world started to recover from these great cataclysmic events, um, certain societies in different parts of the world that were far more advanced than in, in other parts of the world started to appear. They started to appear based on this original knowledge that was global, which had now started to remanifest in a lesser way um, in isolated communities um, in these parts of the world particularly. And when you look around the world, you can see how the original knowledge in so many ways expresses itself in different ways, but it's the same knowledge in different societies because the, the knowledge got fragmented and then went its own way in these, for a while, isolated societies and so got expressed in different ways. But it's the same knowledge. Credo Mutwa, my uh, friend, the Zulu shaman in South Africa, he threw the bones for me a couple of times. He's a carved... Um, uh, bones, which um, the symbols represent something, and you, you, you bring to the basket, you put your hands over the basket. What are you doing? You're putting your energy field into the energy field, because everything's energy. We're decoding it into a physical, like a bone or something, but actually it's energy. You're putting your energy into the bones, and those uh, symbols, by the way, that, by what they represent, carry a frequency field of what they represent. And therefore, they lock into your energy field in certain ways where they sync with things that are happening in your energy field. So then you throw the bones, and where the bones um, end up is decided before you've even thrown them, when they're in the basket, because of the energetic, magnetic connections that have been made there. Then you throw them, and then they become like a symbolic, to a one who knows what they're doing, a symbolic picture of what's going on in your energy field. And people like Kreda Mutwa look at the relationship of different things to each other and they read them in that way. But the point I'm making is when when he did that for me, I thought, it's just like throwing the rune stones in another part of the world. It's just like the tarot cards in another part of the world. Same reason. The reason you pick that tarot card out and not that one is because of the energetic connection you make to that one because that symbol represents something within you. It's all energy, it's all magnetic energy connecting. And also, as these advanced peoples moved into these different parts of the world, one being Atlantis uh, civilization and the other one, Mu or Lemuria, as it uh, later became known to some people, they took, indeed before the cataclysms and after, they took this advanced knowledge and built these fantastic um, structures that some of which we'd even struggle to build today because they were operating on a level of knowledge that is not available in the mainstream today, though we get there. This is Peru where these... Because mainstream history, it's like primitive, less primitive, less primitive, less primitive, us. There's no like, hey, it could be not quite that simple. Um, And and when you go um, to these advanced times way, way back you see fantastic structures. These are hundreds of tons, these stones, and you couldn't put a cigarette paper between them. Primitive people built them, 
Read it somewhere. Then you've got, you've got the Nazca lines in Peru, which were only seen in their entirety, these insects and birds that are created in, by scoring away the topsoil and uh, revealing the, 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 the white below um, in one continuous line. And some of them were only seen in their, in their entirety in modern times when people were flying over them at 1,000, 2,000 feet. <clears throat> and this is a key area of the world in terms of um, that re-emerging knowledge after the cataclysmic time, sometime afterwards too. And these are the ancient societies that were more advanced than so, many of, so much of the rest of the world. And there's a common theme that you find among these ancient societies, um, along with the cataclysms and stuff like that, and that is of um, an interbreeding between what clearly appeared to be non-human, a non-human race and humans to create hybrid bloodlines. Now this, of course, is the most famous one. It's in the Bible. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were the old men of renown in Genesis. But that basic theme of an interbreeding between a non-human race and humans creating a hybrid bloodline is found all over the world. It's found in this area of the world, which in terms of the bloodlines that are in the positions of power today, very, very significant. This area of Sumer, um, which became Babylon in what we call Mesopotamia, and the land between two rivers, and of course, what do we call that today? Iraq. Now, the invasion of Iraq was for many reasons. Oil, yes. Control, yes. Multi-reasons. It's very rarely for one reason. But another reason in that package was because that land we now call Iraq is very historically significant to the bloodlines that in the modern world are behind things like the invasion of Iraq, also Egypt and the Indus Valley uh, culture. And this particularly is very significant in terms of the way the world is controlled today. Sumer, which became Babylon, and again, you have the stories from thousands of uh, clay tablets that were found um, in Iraq and have been uh, translated I call them the Sumerian tablets. And they talk, like all these others around the world, of this interbreeding between non-humans and humans to create this hybrid bloodline. As I've, I've, I'm going to go too much into this because there's so much about the present day I want to get to, through in this section. But um, these bloodlines, these hybrids, became the, the elite. They claimed to be... One of their terms was demigods, part human, part gods, as these non-human uh, groups were perceived to be because they, they had abilities to do things because of their advanced knowledge that made them appear godlike. And uh, the old, ancient, recurring theme of the divine right to rule, which is what? The right to rule because of your bloodline, because of your DNA. We have a head of state. You have a head of state. Same one in Buckingham Palace, who is only head of state because of her bloodline, because of her DNA. If she had a different DNA, she might be cleaning the throne, not sitting on it. That's how ridiculous it is. So even today, we have this still running. And in the background among those that control banking and business and media, we seriously have it running. It's just not official like it is with the official royal families. And these demigods, these hybrid bloodlines, were the ones that ended up in the positions of royal power, and they fought among each other like crazy. For instance, even in China, they, the emperor's... Um, claim the right to be emperor because of their connection to what they called the serpent gods. And, and, and that's a common theme, the serpent or the, the reptilian figure. So these uh, bloodlines, let me uh, 
just hold on that for a second. These bloodlines moved out of that part of the world as uh, what we call time past, and they moved up into Europe. And one of the places that they established themselves was Rome, where they were the bloodlines behind the Roman Empire. Now, one of the common themes that you find wherever these bloodlines went um, is an empire. You had the Babylonian Empire, for instance. They had the Sumer Empire before that, though that's not recognized in official um, history too much. And then you had the Roman Empire, and then they moved up into northern Europe and eventually located their headquarters in Britain, particularly London. And what followed that? The British Empire, on which it was said the sun never set because it was so vast. And then uh, we had this sleight of hand because what the British Empire and the others, the French Empire and others in Europe too, same, but the British Empire was the most significant because of its size, what they did was export the bloodline all over the world. And, crucially, I'll get to this later, the secret society network, which follows the bloodline to manipulate it and its representatives into positions of power to control the societies they target. So what we had when the colonial empires apparently on the surface broke up was global Babylon. Because what happened on the surface the colonial powers gave independence to the countries, like Australia and America and stuff like that. But, in truth, what happened was the bloodline and the secret society network stayed in those countries and have gone on controlling those countries ever since from a central point in Europe. Overwhelmingly London, but there are other places in, in Europe too where, where the, the very significant centers of power for this bloodline network. And there's two types of control. There's a control you can see, touch and taste, communism, apartheid, fascism. And at least the people under those tyrannies understand the situation they're in. They're in a tyranny. And they can see, at least the front men, who are in control of the tyranny. Eventually, it might take a long time, but eventually there will be a rebellion against that kind of tyranny where you know where you stand. The greatest form of control, which can go on forever until it's exposed, is a tyranny you can't see, touch, and taste. Where you're sitting in a prison cell, but you can't see the bars. Because people don't rebel against not being free when they think they are. And so what happened in this sleight of hand when the colonial powers apparently gave independence is there was a move from a tyranny you could see, colonial control from London overwhelmingly, to a tyranny you couldn't see, which is called democracy, which is called putting a, a cross on a piece of paper every four or five years and then the people you voted for or not voted for often doing what, you, what they bloody like. It's called freedom. It's very good. I'm going to try it sometime. And, and so what we've had is a hidden tyranny ever since masquerading as freedom. And what these bloodlines and the secret society network they control have done is set up the equivalent of a transnational corporation. As transnational corporations work, they have a headquarters, and then in the different countries, they have subsidiaries. And the subsidiaries do what the headquarters tell them to do. Corporate policy, they call it. Well, what these bloodlines have done is exactly the same, only it's secret societies uh, for subsidiaries. The headquarters, the center of the web in Europe, dictates the ongoing policy, which is constant centralization of power in every area of our lives to bring about this point where the few can control the many from a central point. And in each country is the subsidiary network of the secret society network. And 
that network in each country has the job, and it's bloody comple completed it a long time ago now, of controlling that country's government, any political party that has ch any chance of forming a government, its banking system, its uh, transnational corporation system, its media ownership, and the military, and all these other institutions, medicine, science. And so having established that in different uh, countries around the world, when the central uh, point, the spider in the, in the center of the web in Europe says, this is what's going to happen now, these subsidiary groups start to uh, bring it about in their sphere of influence, their country. And this is how you see, and it's more and more blatant now, this is how you see the same things happening in every country virtually at the same time. When there's a problem, like um, a financial crisis, engineered of course, then the reaction to the problem, and maybe we could sit down and say, well, maybe we could do that, maybe we could do that, maybe we could do that, what about that, try that. No, no, there's one solution. And in the case we're experiencing now, it's throwing infinite amounts of what we call money at the banking system that created the problem. That is the answer all over the place because that is how it's coordinated to be. The idea is to control through this web every area of the world. And they've been doing it covertly and building up that, that control to the point now, and I said this years ago, there's going to come a point, because it has to come, if they want to bring from the secret and hidden into changes in society, there has to come a point where this stuff breaks the surface where we can see it, because it has to if it's going to become the changes in society they want. And we're at that point now where it's clearly broken the surface and we can see it. And what they've done is created this tapestry web of transnational corporations and groupings which appear to be different and have different owners and different agendas and competing with each other. But it's like going down a high street and you see all these different names and they, again, they see to, some of them seem to be competing with each other. But when you do the research and you go back and you, you look at the holding companies, you find that the same holding company controls this and that and that and that and actually controls this, which is apparently competing with that. And this is what they've done. These um, uh, families and their secret society network, which go under the name of Illuminati, the illuminated ones, they are the force that is ultimately behind all these apparently unconnected groups and corporations, and they move as one unit as a result. And the idea is to imprison humanity in the way that Orwell described, and the way we're experiencing now, not even by the day, but by the bloody hour, of more and more surveillance, more and more control, more and more suppression, more and more police state, And in doing so, manipulating the way we perceive reality so we, as the external world moves in on us, the internal world moves in on us, and we become less and less of who we are. So, let's get real bloody bizarre now. <laughs> if you've never seen my stuff before, it's time to leave. <laughs> um, Who are this non-human group or grouping behind these particular bloodlines and how do they interact? Um, I had to go through this, so everyone else should as well. Um, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was minding my own business in the 1990s and suddenly, uh, I don't know what is this, this, this force I picked up or picked me up, I don't know, 20 years ago. But it's like uh, opening and shutting doors and in, a, in a maze and it's just... Okay, not down there, down there. Look at this. Okay, now look at that. And what tends to happen is a theme comes into my life and suddenly things are coming at me in relation to that theme from every angle. From 2003 to now, it's been the nature of reality all the time. Just earlier to that, from the mid 
just after mid-90s onwards, I kept coming across people who were telling me they'd seen, apparently, human people uh, turn into a reptilian form and then go back again in front of their eyes. And you think, okay, um, right, back burner with that one. But as the months and the years passed, these were coming at me all over the world. Um, and then I started looking at um, ancient texts and stuff like that and accounts, and you could find the same stories being told all that apparently time ago. And there are many non-human entities that are interacting with this uh, reality. Um, but the, 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 the theme that kept, keeps coming to me over the years in relation to these bloodlines behind the Illuminati is of some form of reptilian entities, um, which are the next stage on, because uh, it goes on beyond them, but the next stage on behind the Illuminati bloodlines and the interbreeders with them is this reptilian group, which sounds real strange until you go with it. Now, Again, this is why the first part today is so important. These n people know that the body is a biological computer. So to them, that's how they look at it. What we call procreation is the downloading of two hard drives, if you like, into one, um, which uh, creates the, the, the offspring. To these people, they see that as a downloading of a computer program. And so the obsession, and this is real, goes right back to the ancient world, right up to the present day, the obsession that these bloodlines have, take royalty, aristocracy, and the, um, the, the major uh, banking and uh, business families of the world, they interbreed incessantly um, and always have. And it's because, from their point of view, they are holding a software program, which is what? Information. It's a state of being. And when you interbreed that, these hybrid bloodlines, with the general population, that, to them, unique software program, uh, computer program, starts to dilute very, very quickly. So what they're trying to do is hold that um, software, hold that information within the computers by interbreeding um, with each other. The oldest form of religion and worship so far established is serpent worship. It's massive. It goes right back. 70,000 years ago is the, um, the oldest uh, evidence in um, South Africa of serpent um, worship. And after I'd written a book called The Biggest Secret, when I introduced this for the first time, I went to speak in South Africa... And I met uh, this man, Credo Mutwa, who contacted the organizers of my event and said, I want to talk to this, this man. So I went to see him, and I spent days with him in the end. And he, he first said to me, he said, Mr. David, he said, how do you know about the Chittahuri? And I said, well, who are they? He said, they are the, the children of the serpent, the children of the python. That's what Chittahuri translates as. And he told me that when the colonial powers came into Africa, as everywhere else, they targeted the shaman and the carriers of the ancient knowledge and the ancient history of that area, and in his words, they milked the minds of the shaman and then killed them. So to keep the knowledge um, alive, the shaman streams started to create their own secret societies with horrendous initiation um, rituals to make sure you really wanted the knowledge um, and they carried it underground so it would survive because the, what the colonial powers wanted in other words these bloodlines behind the colonial powers they wanted to destroy as much of the ancient knowledge as possible because then they could impose their own version of history which would write out what they didn't want people to know so um, about uh, what is he now 90 crikey 60 years ago, nearly, he was initiated into these secret societies in South Africa, and that's when he learned about the Chittahuri, and he's gone on learning ever since. That is a painting. He's a brilliant man. He's a library on legs. That's one of his uh, paintings of one um, kind of the Chittahuri, as he calls them. There are many different types, as there are different types 
of uh, human. And he showed me this, uh, what he calls the necklace of the mysteries. Um, it's mentioned 500 years ago in accounts. He reckons it's at least 1,000 years old. And he calls it a necklace. You put it on your shoulders. Oh, my God, it's so heavy. And he sits there for hours with it. I don't know how he does it. Um, and what he does, because he's the official storyteller of the Zulu nation, what he does is use these symbols to tell the story of Africa, the people of Africa. And right at pride of place at the front is a human woman and a very clearly non-human man with a big willy in come and get me mode. And interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, he says that was um, originally gold. And then someone stole it and they couldn't replace it with gold, so they replaced it with copper. But then again, this is Southern Africa. You go to North Africa and the, one of the key foundation stories and myths of ancient Egypt is of the golden penis of Osiris. And the more and more that I see this, these are symbolic of this bloodline, of this uh, connection, these, this, this hybrid uh, bloodline connection. And what um, Credo was saying, yeah, I used to go out with someone like that. It was good. That's the lady. And here's the, um, here's the, here's the guy. Now, he doesn't look very reptilian. I pointed that out to him. Uh, and he said, this is the story. The Chidahori, in the, uh, when they were manifesting openly in some areas, um, said, you must never portray us as we really are, otherwise death. So he said, what people did is they portrayed them as clearly not human in various, in very many, in various ways, but not actually as they really looked. Although if you go one stage back from Sumer in the same area, which was the Ubaid culture, which preceded Sumer in Mesopotamia, now Iraq, you do find in, in, in the graves of uh, Ubaid graves, there have been found very clearly representations of reptilian uh, mothers and babies and all the rest of it. This is a, 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 a symbolic image by Neil Haig of this hybrid bloodline, which has a, we all have, and I'll come to this, we all have reptilian genetics, very, very serious reptilian genetics within the body hologram computer, but these hybrid uh, bloodlines have much more um, reptilian genetics and therefore um, have much more of the reptilian genetic personality, if you like. And around the world, again, it's like, um, have you seen that new car? No, and you see them everywhere. Again, once this reptilian thing came into my life, I started to realize just how much reptilian imagery there is everywhere, all over the world. Uh, and and the, um, the ancient myths and stuff like that of the, um, uh, the Nagas in, um, in Asia, the uh, people who were said to be part reptilian, part human, and could uh, move between the two. And uh, the many images you find portrayed of this uh, coming together of um, earth women and these, this reptilian race and part human, part non-human and, and uh, all the rest of it. These are just a few examples that have been sent to me from around the world, but crikey, there's loads and loads of them that uh, portray the same basic symbol of, again, fighting the snake, fighting the dragon is all part of it. And of course, the very, one of the key stories in the Bible is of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which when you read that story um, in the way it's uh, portrayed, absolutely changed the way that humans um, uh, acted and saw themselves in the world. And you see the symbolic way that it's uh, talked about. And I was on a Christian um, radio station in America a few months back, and uh, you know, they said, oh no, serpents and all that. I said, well, hold on a second. Do you think that if you believe the Garden of Eden story, and again, the Garden of Eden story told in different ways using different names, you can find that all over the world as well. Same recurring theme. And uh, I said, do you really think that uh, if you believe it to be that, that, that the, the serpent in the Garden of Eden was a snake on the ground? Did you know? Could you think it could be some, that could be symbolic of something? And uh, it's just another example of the, um, the reptilian symbolism all over the place. And when you... Um, you look at the castles and the, the stately homes of these bloodlines in the aristocracy and also in the churches as well, and they're behind them, 
and they were behind the building of them, um, then again, you find these what we call gargoyles that have a, a reptilian feel about them. And the coats of arms of so many of these aristocratic families carry the dragon um, in various forms. Some people, and there is a lot of truth and accuracy in it, describe London as Babby London because that is, became the new center of this bloodline network. And that's why this tiny, bloody country just off the coast of Europe had that empire that spanned the world. How could that be? Because the, that was the, 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 the center of their operations and therefore was the center of their empire. And so appropriately... The, the very symbol of the city of London, the financial district, the original city of London, where St. Paul's Cathedral is and all the financial stuff, where they've messed around with the global financial situation as we're currently experiencing, um, the symbol is two flying reptiles holding the shield of a very significant secret society within the Illuminati web called the Knights Templar that control London. Here it is. Very appropriate, and I would suggest not without coincidence, or not coincidence. When you pass into the city of London from the main uh, urban sprawl of London and stuff, um, you pass these flying reptiles on each side of the road holding this Knights Templar shield. Um, and f the district of the city of London, which controls so much of world finance, runs into what is known as the Temple in London, which is named after a Knights Templar temple. And, at the point, and, and that's the, where um, so much of the global, not just British, but the global and certainly the Commonwealth uh, law network is controlled from. At the point where those two meet, the city of London and the temple, is this flying reptile at the, uh, in the center of the road at a place called Temple Bar. And then when you, 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 you look at the recurring themes of, of, of dragons and reptilian uh, monster figures in, and, in myths and stories, they, uh, they go on and on and on. And of course, the whole basis of the Chinese culture and many of the Eastern cultures is of the dragon. And yes, the, you know, things like ley lines were symbolized as dragon lines and all the rest of it, but that's not the only explanation for it. Uh, why would the ancient emperors of China say... Um, uh, we, we, we claim to be emperor because of our descendants from the ley lines. I mean, they wouldn't do that. They said descendants from the serpent gods. That was their symbolism of, of the serpent, the gods. The word Messiah comes from Mesa, which is the fat of the Nile crocodile, which they used to use to anoint pharaohs. Christ itself means anointed one. And even the... The, the devil in the um, Bible is described as in, in reptilian terms. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. And Satan, who deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out on, into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And this theme of fallen angels, again, drops into this same theme of this, um, this takeover which has been gathering pace through the centuries and now is where it is today. This is a painting by Credo Mutwa in South Africa, not far from the Kalahari Desert, which is a painting on his hut, which is symbolizing an ancient uh, African story of the Chittahuri um, and how they ate people. And um, this is Alfa Romeo which is straight from that uh, ancient myth. I mean, why would Alfa Romeo have a bloody snake in a human? It's a bloody car. <laughs> and next to it, of course, is the red cross on the white background of the Knights Templar Secret Society. This is a, a, a home of uh, Silvio Berlusconi, who thinks uh, after a, uh, an earthquake disaster, just see it as having a weekend of camping. I mean, this man's not real, but he's leader of 
Italy, I don't know whether you saw that story, that's what he said that the people in that earthquake zone should see it as, a weekend of camping. I mean, you, you, you can't make these people up. They have no empathy. Um, and again, here's that same um, theme. The fairy stories and the, and the uh, fairy tales of, of the frog turning into the prince and all these constant um, themes uh, relates to the same stuff in the ancient uh, world coming through to today. And this is, um, this is, this is, this is a book that's uh, given to some American school children. And it's about um, shape-shifting from reptilian into human. And uh, they say, I'm crazy. And they're giving, it, they're giving it to school kids. Oh, it's just a story. No, it's not. I wish it was. And this is a point, and this has got me tremendous ridicule. I don't care, I'm bothered. But shape-shifting, right? This is another recurring theme. Not just in the endless people now around the world who said, yeah, I saw that, I've experienced that. Um, and, uh, uh, of seeing someone move from a human to a reptilian form and back again. You find this too in the ancient accounts, the shape-shifters. And not just into reptilian, but into other forms as well. And then... Again, I keep saying it, this is why the first part of this presentation was so important, because without that, we really can't get a fix on some of this stuff. People say, and I understand it completely, you can't shift from a solid body to a solid body and back again, it's daft. I agree completely. You can't. But that's not what's happening. These different physical forms are energetic fields. Let's go back to that... Um, that image from earlier of the, the energy field, it goes through the decoding system and becomes an apparently physical um, form that we see in our everyday life. Shape-shifting takes place in one place only, in the decoding system of the brain, which again itself is a vibrational field beyond the physical. So you have um, an energy field that is human, and you're decoding that into a human body. Then the reptilian level of that comes forward and becomes the dominant field. And suddenly you're decoding a different energy field. And then it returns and you're decoding this one again. In your decoded reality in the experienced holographic physical world, you see someone human, you see them uh, reptilian, you see them human. Did you see that? It's only going on in here. Of course, shape-shifting from solid to solid to solid is impossible, but that's not what it is. How appropriate. <laughs> um, because they're holograms. All physicality is holograms. It is an energetic field, and at the, end, the, the, the level of the energetic field, because it's not solid, it's movable, changeable, and then becomes changeable in the decoded reality as we observe it. In their head. That's where shape-shifting goes on. And again, we are perceiving, through what we call visible light, a tiny frequency range of um, human sight. Human decoding. But just outside of this frequency range, and beyond into frequencies well away from this one, are endless kind of worlds and realities. And I say uh, further away in that sense, but actually they're all sharing the same space. You know, in this uh, space that I'm um, standing in now are all the radio and television stations broadcasting to Melbourne. I can't see them, they can't see each other because they are operating on different frequencies. And when you tune into one of those frequencies, that's what you get. And what this physical body does is to tune us through that telescope I talked about earlier um, into and through the um, receiver transmitter um, uh, crystalline structure, it tunes us into this tiny range of frequencies called visible light, and this becomes the only reality. But interspacing, interspersing this reality is all existence. And just outside of this frequency range, just, just beyond uh, visible light, lie these reptilian entities and many other entities too. And, you know, you, you'll, you'll be in a house and you'll see a cat, for instance, reacting to what is to us empty space. And you'll say, what's wrong with a cat? Don't be daft, nothing there. But there, to the cat, there is something there. Because its visual frequency range 
is much greater than ours, and therefore it's seeing things in the space that we can't see. And it's because this knowledge is kept from us that things that are happening in the world are dismissed as ridiculous and people like me are dismissed as crazy because it's a very simple, very powerful thing. And it's, it sounds a, an obvious truth, but sometimes we miss the obvious truth. People's sense of what's possible comes from what they think is possible. And what they think is possible comes from the information they receive to tell them what is possible. If you suppress the knowledge of what is possible, you suppress their perception of what is possible, and they will laugh in the face of the truth and say it's impossible, when actually, um, it's, if you, if you, if you uh, understand to a greater level than, than the mainstream allows you to understand, you realize not only is it possible, it's perfectly bloody logical. So, just as we have ghosts, as we call them, which, are, uh, which is energy... Out just outside of our frequency range, and sometimes it just enters our frequency range and we can, we can see it as ethereal. Whereas if it was absolutely on our frequency range, it would look as solid as you and me. It's like a, a radio station not being quite on the dial. You don't get a sharp reception, you get interference. And in the same way, um, these reptilian entities lock into these bloodlines and take over their mental and emotional faculties I've talked to many psychics around the world who have, you know, who have the ability to go further out than the norm in terms of their decoding uh, of, of sight. And they, um, many, many of them have told me how they've seen not just reptilian entities, but often, but other entities too, non-human, who are what they call overshadowing humans uh, as they observe them and locking in into these bottom two um, chakra points here, the base chakra and the one just above. And... What they're doing, because the, the, the um, body's a hologram, is they're locking into that um, human energy field and they're taking over its mental and emotional processes and perception processes. Now, oh, let's go back. There you go. Oh, yeah, we'll come to that in a sec. Um, it's all about vibration and vibrational compatibility. These reptilian entities are vibrating to a certain frequency. Humans are vibrating to another frequency. What the hybrid um, idea is about is to infuse as much of this frequency, because that's what it's, it's all about in the end, frequency, because that's the base um, uh, prime reality of, of the hologram. It's to infuse as much of this um, frequency into this frequency to make them as compatible as possible to allow this age-old recurring theme right up to the present day of possession to take place. And it's much easier to possess something that you are in vibrational um, resonance with or much closer to it than something that's, that, that's uh, very much further out. And so these hybrid bloodlines basically are there to create the vehicles that these uh, reptilian entities just outside of this frequency can then take over. And they are manipulating this world through apparently human bodies when if you could see further out, you would see anything but a human overshadowing these people that are in the positions of power. So these guys, I found this uh, picture on the internet, it's very appropriate. These guys are basically empty shells. Um, and they are uh, vehicles to... I'm not saying every one of these are, but I think most of them are from what I'm looking at. But the basic theme is the people in positions of power are merely vehicles for something else that is um, in control of their faculties and control of their um, mind processes. So we have the, the, um, the advisors in the shadows within this reality um, who really are in control of the people who appear to be in power and then one step back from them, just outside of this visible light dimension, we have these entities that are um, calling, the, calling the, uh, the, the, the shots in, in so many ways through into this reality in terms of what happens here. And after you know, my experience of this explanation of the schism and all the rest of it, I, I refer to these now as the schism people because they are, this schism 
resonates out down into this reality, this um, disharmonious um, uh, conflict, uh, chaos, and all the rest of it. And as it plays itself down into this reality, it manifests itself in various ways. And it is in those entities that lock into that schism uh, energy, they manifest its state of being. They are expressions of it. And you find that these people do not have the basic values of compassion, empathy that most humans have because they're locked into a uh, deeply disharmonious and imbalanced uh, consciousness that um, manifests um, out those values. And so to these people, um, pepper bombing Baghdad, they have no emotional consequence for that at all because they have no empathy. Whereas we would be, we, we couldn't do it because we would have empathy with the consequences for others of their actions. And so they are operating on a completely different point of observation of life, reality, uh, than we are. And therefore, anything goes with these people because of that. And these schism people, as they've, as they've taken control of human society, have created what? A human society that represents that schism. It's division. It's fighting with each other. It's trying to get, um, compete with each other, dominate each other, top dog, up the greasy pole. They're all manifestations of this basic energy disharmony. And so it goes up the levels from the human up through, eventually, um, to this schism energy. And all these things are, ma are manifestations within the decoded holographic world of the state of disharmony of this energetic um, schism which has um, affected life in this reality, this part of it anyway, so fundamentally. So you have these reptilian entities, I'm sure other entities too, but the reptilian thing keeps coming up, who take over the, the, the thought process and mental processes. And we see the human when we decode that energy field of human, but behind it is something looking very different. Um, someone sent me this picture. Um, it may be a, yeah, a, just a play of the light, but it's symbolic of what so many people see. Uh, some people see full body shifts. Talk to those people all around the world. But what seems to be the common theme more than anything is the eye shift, where they take on a reptilian type um, straight down pupil instead of the round one of the, of, of the human, very much symbolized by this. And a few weeks ago, a scientist friend of mine um, called me and said he'd been chatting to a, an acquaintance of his who's just been doing, I mean, I don't agree with it, but he's just been doing research into iris scan uh, technology which led him to look very closely at 2,300 um, eyes as part of this research. And his friend didn't know anything about my stuff at all. He was just in a conversation, and he said that around 4% of the eyes that he looked at very closely appeared to be of reptilian type and appearance, which is maybe about the percentage we're looking at. Someone sent me this with Father George Bush. I don't know. I think that's, it may, again, a play on the light almost certainly, but so symbolic because I know a number of people have seen this guy shift. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a magazine. It's called Fortean Times or something. A few years ago, they ran this front page picture, you know, taking the mick out of me. Um, and I said, thank you very much. That's just very symbolic. I love that. Thanks very much. Um, and so... <laughs> You find a few of these pictures on the internet now as it gets around. Hey, there you go. Um, and one of the things that I've looked at very closely over the years, particularly to the end of the, towards the end of the 80s and early, uh, early across 2000 and so, are the mind control projects and the satanic ritual abuse projects um, to help people who've been through that. And um, the number of times when people have been through satanic ritual abuse and all the rest of it that they talk about in reptilian, in reptilian terms about what they experienced. And these were some pictures 
um, drawn by someone who went through satanic ritual abuse of um, the kind of things that she remembers from what happened in the rituals. And again, as, and the reason the therapist sent these to me with the person's permission, of course, was because she was constantly drawing reptilian imagery because that's what she experienced um, in the ritual. And if you remember um, Rosemary's Baby, that film of the 60s, which was um, directed by Roman Polanski, and shall we say he should bloody know, um, with Mia Farrow, and um, she was manipulated by a satanic family to be impregnated, to give birth to this, this child. And at the end of the movie, when you saw briefly the child in the crib, which was a hybrid, it had reptilian eyes very uh, clearly. And... Um, I could say Roman Polanski should know. So this um, uh, theme of possession goes way, way back through history. And it's possession um, through um, overwhelmingly, in this case, uh, vibrational compatibility because of this interbreeding. There you go. Good old tone. So what they're talking about him being the first president of Europe now. Crikey, it gets worse, doesn't it? Um, Mr. Fake Smile, Mr. Fake Emotion. One of the things I've noticed about these people, and when I was in the Green Party years ago in Britain, I, I, I saw a number of British politicians close up, and you see their dark eyes, and you see something else. Their eyes and their, their face don't talk the same language, as I call it. You know, it's, an, it's funny how people are, how, are famous or infamous for their massive smile, like Obama and Blair. But when you see the big smile, look at the eyes. Hillary Clinton's a classic. The big smile, the eyes never smile. Cold, steely eyes. But what's behind these people? Just a touch vibrationally out of human sight, behind the painted smile. This guy, Ted Heath, when I, he was Prime Minister of Britain from 1970 to 1974. He was the guy that signed us into the European Union. Um, major person involved in the Bilderberg Group and various other things. And I wasn't into any of this stuff at the time. I was a national spokesman for the British Green Party. And uh, I, um, I, was in, I was asked to go and speak on this election program uh, on Sky News years ago, back in the 80s, 89 it was. And um, I, I arrive and the lady takes me into this makeup room and we go through the door and it appears to be empty. She says, someone will be along in a minute and walks out. So I sit down in the chair, I'm looking at the mirror and I catch someone just to my right and I look across and it's this bloke who'd just been um, interviewed on the program and he was sitting there waiting to have the makeup taken off. So, you know, cheery bloke. I said, oh, all right, mate, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Um, and uh, no word was spoken by this guy in the entire um, experience. He sat there looking at the mirror and when I said hello, he turned his chair and he looked at me. A very strange look. And his, his head never moved once he turned it. Then his eyes started at the top of my head. I went slowly down my body, real slowly, to my feet, and then went back again and then turned and looked at the mirror. And all I could say, looking back, he was scanning me. The thing was, though, when he was scanning me and I was looking at him, all his eyes, whites as well as everything else, went completely black. And what I found since is a few things. First of all, this guy was seriously into Satanism, was a major Satanist in Britain, and child abuser. I put it in my books while he was dead now, but I put all this in my books while he was alive. And a journalist rang him and said, you've seen what this David Icke bloke's saying about you? And, oh, he must be mad. And that was the end of it, because it was true. I talked to the people, uh, many people he abused. And the other thing that I found after I had this experience and I got into this stuff after 1990 are the stories around the world of the black-eyed people of which the same story is told. These people's eyes go completely bloody black. And you know, when we look at each other, we make what we call eye contact. But when, you, when I was looking into Ted Heath's eyes, there was no point where there was any contact I, was, I, I described it <clears throat> to my family when I got home. You never, never believe what I've just experienced with Ted Heath. It, I said to them, it's, it was like looking into two black holes. There was no point where there was a, 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 a contact. And what I understand now, it was looking through the physical human energy field into that which um, was behind him, um, that which you never see. 
So we all thought these people, and if we could see not that far beyond visible light, we'd see something overshadowing these people that is uh, very different to the way they look. Oh, I love that. <laughs> hey. They say a picture tells a thousand words, don't they? Oh, yes. And that's the other thing. And you know, what are the British royal family famous for? Emotionless behavior towards their offspring and stuff. And you find that a lot with these, not always. And again, you know, I'll throw this away, but the thing that I've more and more begun to kind of understand, uh, or at least go in, in that direction, seeking more understanding, is that because we live in a digital um, reality on one level, you know, you've seen these adverts, where the, the digital adverts now, where they put in famous actors from the past, from movies, and they put them in with modern actors in, in adverts and stuff. They don't do it so much now, but a few years ago, it was very popular. And the real best ones, you can hardly tell the bloody difference, even at that level of technology. The, the, the level we're talking about in terms of the reality and the manipulation, the reality is light years beyond anything that we, we, we have here. And... You know, they talk about sentient programs in the Matrix and, you know, the woman in the red dress who appears to be absolutely like everyone else, but is actually just a digital insert. More and more that I understand this, I'm sure there are vast numbers of digital inserts around, and I think a lot of them are these people, actually, um, that are just vehicles for, um, vehicles for this, these other entities just outside of human sight to run this reality. And it seems to me there are three types. There are those that are di digital implants. There are those people in the world who are conscious and, and have the potential to connect to consciousness, but are stuck in mind, which I talked about earlier. And there are those, and thank goodness they're in increasing number as this awakening goes on, who actually are in this reality, but are connecting to levels of awareness beyond it. And uh, that's where the, the, um, the change lies. Oh, Neil Haig knocked this out as a bit of a joke. Uh, the red dress um, bloodlines of um, the uh, digital implants, maybe. This guy, Carl Sagan. What time is it? We're obsessed with time. Uh, I'm not doing too bad. Um, this guy, Carl Sagan, the cos cosmologist, he wrote um, about, in great detail, about the um, impact of reptilian genetics upon humans. Uh, and human behavior, and he wrote this book, the, the Dragons of Eden, going back to history and the talk of dragons and the reptilian and stuff, but also the reptilian genetics that is within all of us. Fundamental part of the human body, the human hologram, is, um, is reptilian genetics, and as this guy said, understanding the um, reptilian background to the, to, to the human uh, body, or the human being, as he called it, is to understand so much about human behavior. The oldest part of the human brain is called the R complex by scientists, short for reptilian brain, um, because of the reptilian input that we, we've had um, in our uh, body development. Now, there are other parts of the brain that balance out the characteristics of the reptilian brain, but if you have an infusion of greater reptilian genetics, you are going to have, obviously, a greater infusion of the um, characteristics of the reptilian genetics. And this is mainstream science when they're talking about the reptilian brain. From there, we get primitive emotional responses and emotional responses, cold-blooded behavior and territoriality, as they call it. This is mine. I own it. I control it. A desire to control. An obsession with hierarchical structures of power, aggression, might is right, winner takes all, come from the reptilian brain. And they are absolutely the characteristics of the Illuminati families. Also from the reptilian brain, we get the um, survival responses, and on that level they're very good, things like fight or flight and all that stuff that gets you out of danger. So, the more we can be put into a sense of survival in our perception and state of mind, the more we are locking into that reptilian part of the brain, and that's the kind of stadium that these people understand 
more than any other. And we're being locked into that all the time as we are manipulated to fear not surviving in endless ways. Not just severe uh, fearing not surviving in terms of uh, life and death, but fearing not paying the mortgage at the end of the month, fearing of having your house foreclosed. They all lock you in to a sense of needing to survive. And the other thing that these, uh, these entities do is feed off human energy. And to feed off human energy, they have to pull humans into an energetic state that they can feed off. If you're in a state of harmony, they can't feed off it because never the twain shall meet vibrationally. So they pull us or seek to pull us into a state of disharmony, of stress, of fear, of conflict, of aggression, of anger and all the rest of it. Because that's pulling us into an energetic state that they can then feed off because that's their energetic state. Um, and they seem to operate in what an astrophysicist friend of mine called uh, Giuliana Conforto calls interspace planes, which is like a neutral zone between uh, dimensions, where you need um, to, as she puts it, find a source of energy because there's not a natural source of energy there on the scale that there is within um, a, a fully-fledged uh, reality dimension, whatever you want to call it. And I said to Kredo Mutwa, do you have anything in your culture that relates to interspace planes, these neutral zones? He said, oh, yes, he said, we call them the heaven between heavens. He said, that's where the Chittahuri are. Um, and so that, that takes them so close to visible light and the um, reality that we're experiencing. And what they're doing is feeding off human energy by manipulating us into an energetic state in which they can feed off, and also to keep us in mind and not open to consciousness. Years ago, last time I came to um, Australia, I had a strange experience. I spoke in Sydney, and afterwards I was introduced to this Freemason who said he was 33rd degree or something. He wanted to meet me because he wanted to know how I knew what I knew. He said, yeah, how do you know that? You're not supposed to know these things. So anyway, I met him, and he said... Um, I said, I'm a good Freemason, he said. I, I'm, I'm trying to fight some of the bad things. I said, okay. Uh, he said, um, if you come to Canberra, he said, I'll show you around Canberra and I'll, I'll show you the, the, the Freemasonry imagery. So, okay, I'll go. So I went to Canberra and I met this guy and he showed me all around the Parliament building and all the street plan around there and all the rest of it. And then he took me into the, the, um, the war memorial, the war museum memorial in, in Canberra. And my God, it is a blaze with Illuminati and reptilian symbolism. And when you go into the part where the unknown soldier grave is, on the four corners and the pillars are depictions of soldiers, men and women. And then you've got the light coming up from the top of their head going up. And you've got a reptilian um, uh, figure s sitting above that, almost policing the connection to out there and this satanic symbolism and all this stuff and when you look at the um, the sponsors of the war museum um, a number of them are like a who's who of the Illuminati in um, in Australia according to this guy anyway I'll tell you what he said to me he said we need to get you some money I said what do you mean he said yeah he said we need to get you some money to fund what you're doing I said well hold on I said how are you going to do that he said we'll give you a credit card I don't know who we was he said we'll give you a credit card I said well how will that help me he said well we fix the computer system so no matter how much you spend, it never registers. He says, that's, he says, that's how we get our money, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, I thought, I'm not sure about that in the least. And we said goodbye. He said, look, I've got lots of things to tell you. And never heard from him again. Disappeared from the face of the bloody earth. Um, it's still around in Australia, I'm sure, but there you go. So... This, this interspace plane is, 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 is one of the kind of, kind of um, stumbling blocks energetically which, which is trying to manipulate us from getting um, uh, connected to the full nature of who we are. So this is kind of, seems to be the, the structure. Certainly at this level, it goes further out up to that schism, I believe, but at this level, you've got the reptilian entities... Um, and Nephilim, that was the, the name of the hybrid bloodline in the Bible, the Nephilim, uh, just one of many, many names that they're called around the world in different cultures. The reptilian entities um, 
possess their um, hybrid stooges. And the secret society network within this reality manipulates the stooges and their gophers and agents into the positions of power at the top of the pyramids in all these different countries. These are the subsidiary networks I'm talking about. They then uh, control um, all these other things like politics, finance, media, military, religion, and the royal uh, networks because that locks into them. And then down come the people. And these people at the top who appear in everyday reality and on the news bulletins often to be at odds with each other and fighting each other. And so lots of infighting goes on among these people because they're so imbalanced that they're going to, of course they're going to fight for them, among themselves, but there is a level that knocks heads together when it gets in the way. And so they're manipulating, playing different um, countries and groups and Islamic and stuff off against each other. And if you notice, the people that declare the wars never bloody fight them. These people go off like silly sods and fight them. And these people who have nothing against these people, but those people tell them they should and, they, and all the rest of it. And the people fight among themselves, creating great stress, great uh, disharmony, energy to be absorbed and all the rest of it. Um, because they're manipulated by the tiny few into this stuff. I mean, if George Bush, boy George Bush, had been in Iraq when the first bullet was fired, he'd have been under a bed in Houston when the second bugger went off. These people do not fight the wars, they just declare them. We fight the wars, and if we stop fighting the sodden wars and came together, we've made the whole system completely impotent. So these are schism people coming down the levels of reality. And they feed off the energy that we um, generate through our states of emotional and mental states, and they manipulate that. Now, the one energy they can't take, um, the many energies they can't take, that they're in harmony, but what we call love, the energy of the heart, no way they want anything to do with that. They can't, they can't cope with it, and they can't sync with it, and they want to shut that energy off, and that's what they do by manipulating society and playing us off against each other. There's a guy called uh, Mr. Emoto, a Japanese researcher, I spent a long time with, spent a whole weekend with once in London. We actually wrote a book together, funnily enough, um, just not uh, writing, but just talking and it all being trans translated. Um, and he's famous for filming... Uh, water crystals um, where he has put the water in contact with various vibrational states and indeed just writing love on the side of the uh, container or hate or putting a mobile phone on it or whatever and what he then does is, and I've seen his, um, his uh, uh, laboratory and stuff in um, Tokyo, he freezes it very very quickly and what is then captured in the water crystal is the vibration of the love on, written on the side. Because uh, you write love, generates love. If that's the, the, the motive of writing love, uh, hate, all the rest of it. So that is what a water crystal exposed to words of love and appreciation looks like. This is what a water crystal looks like when it's exposed to um, hate. Now, that's the world before the schism. This is the world afterwards. And it's this energy that re represented by that crystal that these guys want us to produce and, and the operations, uh, the, the level that they operate on themselves. So we need to be very careful about the way we talk to each other, the way we express things, because if you can put the word love on the side of a container of water and create that difference or hate, imagine what we're doing to the energy field and our own individual energy fields as we interact when we are hurling abuse at each other. But that's what these guys want. That's, they want to conflict, schism, break up. The society is just a, a manifestation of that schism. So that again is love and appreciation. This is a crystal uh, from water that had a mobile phone tied to it. And everyone's got a mobile phone. Oh, I've got a mobile phone. They're ever so convenient. Yeah, they burn my brain. It's good. 
It was a convenient. You don't have to get anyone to burn your brain for you. It does it automatically. <laughs> so the idea, and my God, have they, have, 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 have they succeeded up to this point, is to turn humanity at war with itself. That's the way they do it. And uh, in this film, uh, Monsters, Inc., which I took my son to years ago when he was a little boy, I nearly fell off the bloody floor because that was all about monsters going from the monster world where there was no um, uh, source of energy into the human world, frightening children. The scream uh, was caught in a, uh, in a kind of tube and they brought it back to the monster world to um, uh, be the power system of their world. And fear is the biggest um, not just control of humanity and suppressor of humanity, it's the biggest uh, creator of this energetic state that they want. The Matrix talked about feeding off human energy and all the rest of it, turning humans into batteries. And that's uh, what we're looking at in terms of the, the way you, uh, the society is created. There are many physical underground um, areas um, which have been reported to contain reptilian and non-human entities, and I'm sure that's true within this reality, within visible light, but it's the ones that are just outside that seem to be the, the cause of this. There are many reptilian entities that seem to be very uh, benevolent too. But the foundation of it all is puppet people. Without this, none of this other garbage could actually happen. That is prime. And the idea is to constantly uh, take us in the wrong direction make us misunderstand ourselves and reality so we act in the ways that suit them. To be in this bewildered state. The world is crazy, we think it's sane. So, God, I wish I had, I wish I had till midnight. I could keep going. Um, this, um, so much, so much, it all connects. So, it seems to be a bewildering world. And, uh, are totally chaotic and in, on the play out side it does seem to be like that yes but it's not really if you take a step back and the key thing um, that I try to get across all the time are what I call coordinates key coordinates once you have these coordinates the, the crazy kind of complex what is all about world starts to take on a serious level of clarity um, how if you control the world a uh, pyramid power the idea, if you look at the way they've structured uh, society, uh, both collectively and individually, whether it's a school or a university or a government or a corporation, they structure them as pyramids. And on a collective level, they have um, that thing here. I've been told I have to be very careful here or I'll shut the whole thing down. That's really good, isn't it? This, they, they make a piece of technology and right next to, to, to the laser pointer is, is a a button that will shut the whole thing down. <laughs> I never went to university. Um, but, okay, um, this opens the door and this activates the nuclear weapon, okay? <laughs> the way they've structured is to hoard the knowledge, this advanced knowledge, both of what we'll be talking about now and what we talked about in the first section in the highest levels of these pyramid structures that they've created. Every organization virtually today is a pyramid. You've got the few at the top who know what the game's really about. And as you come down from those few, you meet more and more and more people in these different structures. But as you go down, they know less and less and less about what the organization's really about. They're just going in, making their contribution, and going home. They don't know how their contribution locks into this contribution and that lock contribution, again, all innocent in and of themselves, to create anything but an innocent picture. Only they know that. So what they've done is hoarded the knowledge, not least uh, through the secret society network, and they've sucked as much of that knowledge out of circulation as they can. And their nightmare now is it started to come back. Too bloody bad, um, guys. It's about time. And uh, this guy, Albert Pike, who was a Freemasonic god in America um, in the 1800s, sovereign grand commander, mother supreme council of the world, and all this stuff. They love their titles, these people. Pathetic. Um, and he wrote this. This was in a, 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 a book for Freemasons. 
Fictions are necessary to the people, and the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it in all its brilliance. In fact, what can there be in common between the vile multitude and sublime wisdom? The truth must be kept secret, and the masses need a teaching proportional to their imperfect reason. That's what they do, is hoard the advanced knowledge and give us a fake version of reality. And this is um, the structure which shows, uh, and I'm probably being bloody optimistic where I put these people. These are the levels of presidents and prime ministers and head of NATO and stuff. This is where, within the bloodline network and the shadow people right at the top, you never see, this is where the real power is. And these people who appear to be in power are actually just vehicles to introduce what is decided there into mainstream society. George Bush is a classic. Oh, hey, there he is, synchronicity. He's the next one. So people said, George Bush is big brother. What? He can't tie his shoelaces. No, he's not big brother. <laughs> he's just a front man. And um, if, you can, if you are in the public eye as a president and prime minister, you are by definition a front man. man they don't put their um, key people there. They put gophers there. They might be in on, in on it, a lot of them, and some of them don't. They're just manipulated, and some of them just want power and will do anything necessary for it. So they'll say, you know, We'll put you in power if you do this. Okay. Okay. And so they'll become prime minister or president. And so now it's no different. This guy reads teleprompters better than George Bush did. But apart from that, policy is pretty much the bloody same, hidden by rhetoric. Um, and in every country, including Australia, Britain, everywhere, you have um, overwhelmingly two parties, usually, that have any chance of, of forming a government. And so people think, oh, we're going to change to them now, oh, we'll change to them now. But the same force controls both sides, so whoever's in power um, is a representative of this force in the shadows. As some people say in America, um, you know, don't vote, it only encourages them. You know, um, I've not voted for years, it's a waste of time. Do you want this mask on the face or do you want that mask on the face? No, thanks. I'll go home, thanks, have a cup of tea do a lot more good than voting for either of them. This, uh, this guy, David Roskopf, is a former managing uh, director of Kissinger Associates, notorious Illuminati company, and he wrote this book um, last year called Superclass, in which he, he talked about a power elite um, that was making the world, but it was a cover story. It's becoming so blatant now that a few are running the show that this was a, a book to divert people away. Oh, yes, there is an elite, but they're not connected. They're just loosely because they all don't. Oh, shut up. <laughs> it's fundamentally controlled, man. Go away. Take your check. Leave me alone. And so this is how they've structured global society of a series of pyramids within pyramids within pyramids, like Russian dolls, one inside a bigger doll, inside a bigger doll, inside a bigger doll. And so in the end, all these different pyramids of media, banking, politics, education, media, uh, religion, all the rest of it, intelligence agencies, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, all of it, they all go are pyramids, and eventually they all answer to the same pyramid peak, which are these Illuminati families. And through this structure, they can put down from that uh, point the same policies of incessant centralization of power and other uh, changes in society, which here, as we experience them, are seem to be coming from unconnected groups and institutions and places of society, when if you go to that point, they're all coming from the same point, and that's why it's so coordinated, and that's why now it's happening so quickly, because it's so coordinated. So what you have is one force manipulating in the play-out world of the daily experience, often apparently people in conflict with each other. It's all a game. It's all a mind game. To, this is the movie I talked about earlier, and this is the secret agenda that manipulates the movie to manipulate human perception in the same way that we've seen here um, in that image. And uh, these people, in the end are just puppets of this force. And like I say, I'll just go back on that one, but only quickly. This um, is to emphasize the point that because of their uh, genetic makeup and energetic makeup, 
And uh, the, the, the way that I now begin to understand they're connected to this schism um, energy in terms of their perception, this is why they can do these things and have no emotional consequence whatsoever because they appear to have a very uh, low, at least low, sometimes non-existent level of empathy with the consequences for others of their actions. Another coordinate, methods of manipulation. I think one of the most effective things I've ever come up with in this whole 20 years is this, uh, program, uh, this uh, description of problem, reaction, solution, because it is so fundamental to pushing this whole thing on. Um, and it's very simple, a bit of this room will know about it, but just go for it, because we're doing a DVD of this as well, so we'll, um, it, for people watching the DVD, I haven't come across this before, maybe. It's very simple. You want to change society in a way that you know that if you um, announce it openly, you're going to get a massive public reaction against it. So you don't do that. Stage one, you create a problem covertly. You get someone else to be blamed for it. It could be 9-11. It could be uh, a, a government collapse. It could be the economic crisis we're having now. Um, it could be a war. You then tell through an unquestioning, pathetic mainstream media the version of the problem you want the public to believe, i.e. bin Laden orchestrated it from a cave in Afghanistan or something. And, um, and if we had a media worth the name, problem, reaction, solution would collapse. Because at this point, they would investigate the official version, find it was a load of old crap, and they'd report to the public it was a lot of old crap. That's what real journalists do. We don't have many. John Pilger's one, mind, Australian. He's one. And... Instead, we go official version of events reported to the public virtually unquestioned, and it becomes official history without question. At stage two, you want the public to react with anger, with um, fear, with outrage, and you want them to say basically something must be done. What are they going to do about it? And then those who have created the problem got that reaction, then change society openly through legislation to offer the solutions to the problems they have themselves covertly created. And that method alone has advanced this agenda through the centuries more than any other technique of manipulation. Um, the 33rd degree of Freemasonry has this Latin motto, ordo ab chao, order out of chaos, problem, reaction, solution. Create the chaos and then offer a new order, a new order, which is the code name for this conspiracy. And God, it's coming out the, their, their mouths all over the place at the moment, isn't it? We need a new world order. You do surprise me. So <laughs> this Second World War. The same uh, families and networks were behind Soviet communism, were behind uh, the United States, were behind Britain and the uh, so-called allies, and they were behind Nazi fascism. They put Hitler in power. They funded Hitler. How did Germany go from the Weimar Republic, where they were taking their wages home in wheelbarrows, such was the inflation, to a, a war machine that took on Europe? Because it was externally um, funded by people like the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers funded um, Adolf Hitler's race purity expert, Ernst Rudin, on a whole floor of a German university to come up with his race purity crap. And it was funded by the Rockefellers in America. Because once you realize that this, this force is working through all sides, like we've just seen with that image, it suddenly is no longer a contradiction that a so-called American family, they have no allegiance to America, they have allegiance to their agenda, um, an American family would fund and create the war machine that then took on and killed so many Americans as well as so many other people. It's not a contradiction anymore when you know how the game works. And because they brought these two together, they created a massive global problem which allowed them to offer a massive global solution. All those United Nations, like the, the League of Nations after the First World War, and all the Bretton Woods Agreement, the World Bank, the IMF, and all this stuff was justified, including the European Union. Let's come together in Europe and we'll stop a war. Let's come together and have a central control of Europe, which we've just fought a war to stop. Um, uh, all came together justified by stopping war in Europe. And now we have a, a, another version of it, which I call no problem reaction solution, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. You don't need even a real problem, you just need the perception of the problem to get the public to support or at least not to um, uh, efficiently 
uh, reject what you want to do to change society. And this, now we are facing a presidential version of problem, reaction, solution. To put that in the light, I can see what I'm bloody doing now. I kept looking at me watch and uh, misreading the time. I was very proud of that. I don't want to read the time, really. I want to stay here forever. Um, I'm just getting started. What we've seen in America is presidential problem, reaction, solution. They brought Bush in, just as a front man, um, fronted up, fronting up these neoconservative, neocon people that were behind the Bush era and the invasion of Iraq and all this stuff, and Afghanistan. And his job, <clears throat> or that group's job, was to create massive problems, um, not least uh, foreign wars and stretching them militarily, but also to create massive financial problems towards the end of the Bush administration, which is exactly what they did. And then there's a massive problem, there's great fear and anxiety, and then they bring in the used car salesman with the big smile and the dark eyes and very good at reading teleprompters called Barack Obama. And you know, there were people, I got a little stick when I started talking about Obama and his background a few months ago, because you know, he, it, was like, it was like criticizing Jesus at the time, not quite so much now, mind. Um, and um, people I thought knew better actually believed that this man could come out of nowhere and as a genuine man with a, taking the, 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 the country in a different direction for good for the people would somehow attract the biggest funding of any presidential candidate in American history. And most of it came from Wall Street. Now, I ask this, do turkeys really vote for Christmas if they are aware that that's what they're doing? <laughs> no. They funded him because he is just a front man for them. Um, and he's uh, done very well. This was his greatest, you see, because of the problems of the Bush era, this was his greatest uh, uh, asset, anybody but Bush. And so what they did was sell this fantasy. This man comes out of the most corrupt political system in America and further afield to Chicago. You cannot prosper in Chicago politics unless you are corrupt and or you will do whatever those behind you say you should do or say. What they did was turn him into an empty screen. And they did it by simply using key words. I stand for change. Now, that's a good one. Because the way the system works, at any point in time, most people are sick to death of the status quo. So anyone coming along and saying, I stand for change, well, at least we'll have him because well, we don't like the way things are. It's very powerful. That's what Clinton used to get to power. I stand for change. And stand for hope. Now, hope is a good thing. We must hope. No, we mustn't hope. Hope's in the future that doesn't exist. Hope is always the, the horse on the carousel that's just a bit in front of yours and you're never going to catch it up. Hope is a holding position from real change. That's what hope is. Um, he's an empty suit. But because at no point did he define in any detail what hope, what change, what something to believe in really meant, because if he did, they'd say, oh, that's what it means. I'm not having that. Keep it simple. And what they did brilliantly was to create a blank screen on which the American people, or vast numbers of them, projected what, their, what hope, something to believe in, and change meant to them. So they turned him into all things to all people. And then once he is elected, well, bugger all that, we've got power now, and everything goes on as before. All oh, the rhetoric's different, the words are different, but what is happening is exactly the same as in the Bush era in all the basic things. Change, change, change. It's all mind control. You look at that, and what you are being told in a, on a subconscious level is he stands for change, he stands for change, something we can believe in. And that is there to influence your conscious mind eventually into voting for the guy. This is what Adolf Hitler said. 
Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. It's just the same technique that's been used over and over again. The wolf found that shepherd's clothing worked even better. And that's what he is. Oh, he's such a nice man. I love you, Barak. <laughs> well, that's good. Let's love everybody, but let's be streetwise as well. He's just a front man for the gang who funded him in the Patriot Act, this Orwellian abomination. Yes, he's supporting the furtherance and continuance of that and all the rest of it. And what has he done since he got in? Hurl money at the banks. This is the truth. This is what Barack Obama is really about. And more and more people are seeing that. And even the people with their eyes closed, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, shut up, shut up, are going to have to face it eventually. This is the guy behind Barack Obama, or one of the key men behind Barack Obama. Uh, so big new Brzezinski. Um, who is a massive insider within this network I'm talking about, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. How ironic he stands here and contemplates that Barack Obama is now sending thousands more troops into Afghanistan to overcome the problem. Ah, really? Well, his best mate here, who picked him up in the 80s and is, uh, with others has brought him through to be president, it was always planned, um, has gone public some years ago now, uh, two or three years ago, in a Paris magazine, admitting that when he was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, he decided that he wanted, in his words, to give the Soviet Union their Vietnam. So what he then did was, own words, he funded and trained what were called freedom fighters, became known as the Mujahideen, in Afghanistan to start causing trouble for the government in Kabul, the capital, which at that time was a satellite government of the Soviet Union. What he was doing was trying to entice the Soviet Union to, his words, to invade Afghanistan and then become embroiled in a Vietnam-type um, endless war that they couldn't win, as other people have found in Afghanistan. And that's what the Soviet Union did. And they were there for about 10 years, and never mind the Russians who died, a million Afghans died. And this guy thought, well, that's not a problem, own words, because it gave um, them their Vietnam and brought them down as a superpower. This is how these people think. And now the man who created the Mujahideen, funded and trained them, which then became the Taliban, and, 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 and uh, the, the guy um, Osama bin Laden was brought out of Saudi Arabia to front up that Mujahideen resistance to the Soviet invasion. The man who started all that going, because he's a, just an he's asset, bin Laden, absolutely, totally convinced he's dead. I mean, you know, no one ever talks about him anymore, do they? Isn't it funny? Um, uh, Brzezinski, the man who started it all, is the guy, or one of the key guys behind Obama, who's now saying we've got to put the thousands of troops into Afghanistan to stop the Taliban. Uh, have a word with your mate. And Brzezinski talks about this area. He's been talking about this area for a long time. He calls it Eurasia. And he says that to control the world, in effect, in simple terms, you need to control Eurasia, this area of land that includes key places like Afghanistan, Iran, um, the places around the Caspian Sea, this great uh, area of, of oil and gas reserves like Georgia where they've been having problems uh, recently, Pakistan and all these, this area which so much of the world is now focusing on um, is this area of the world going up into Russia and Brzezinski seems to have a morbid uh, genetic hatred of Russia for some reason um, and uh, that's what we're seeing. And Henry Kissinger is uh, now being used by Obama, officially anyway, to uh, negotiate and stuff with, Ru with the Russians, which is, you know, it's, it's like sending an atom bomb to a, uh, a peace conference. Um, and this guy, of course, Henry Kissinger, is, um, 
is one of the most uh, blatant and high-profile manipulators for this Illuminati in the last 40 uh, to 50 years. And um, the uh, Brzezinski, in 1973, with David Rockefeller, set up one of the key organizations in the Illuminati network, at, the, uh, at one level anyway, called the Trilateral Commission. Um, that's how much of an insider he is. And um, this is the network. It's around a secret society called the Round Table. It goes um, to the, round, down to the start, or just before the start of the 20th century. And these groups, like the Bilderberg Group, the Club of Rome, which manipulates the environmental movement, get to that later, Royal International Affairs in London, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations in America, the United Nations, all these connect into that secret society. And um, Brzezinski is a major player to the point where he co-founded the Trilateral Commission. This is the guy behind Barack Obama. And this is what he wrote in 1970, Brzezinski. The technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite, unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance on over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. 1970. This has been planned for a long, long time, which is unfolding apparently spontaneously now. And when you look at Obama's policies, all you need to do is look at um, Brzezinski's books before anyone had heard of Obama. This is what uh, he wrote in a book before Obama ran for president. Needed social reassessment can be encouraged by deliberate civic education that stresses the notion of service to a higher cause than oneself. As some have occasionally urged, a major step in that direction would be the adoption of an obligatory period of national service for every young adult, perhaps involving a variety of congressionally approved domestic or foreign, foreign good works. Barack Obama. Policy. Obama will call on citizens of all ages to serve America by developing a plan to require 50 hours of community service in middle school and high school and 100 hours of community service in college um, every year. Watch this in Australia. I don't know if they're trying to do this here, but they will because they're, they're, they're talking about it now in Britain and they want this everywhere. This is uh, the policy continued, Obama's policy. We cannot continue to rely on our military in order to achieve the national security objective we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. They want to create, in every country, civilian security networks to police the people. The people policing the people. And they'll start to suggest it everywhere. He's just the guy who's triggering it in America. And because of his worldwide kind of fame, um, he he um, has an ability to sell it in other countries as well. So it's not just Brzezinski. This guy, um, George Soros, is a notorious um, Illuminati manipulator, not least in financial terms. Um, and he's one of the major funders and backers of Obama as well. And uh, his networks were behind the uh, spontaneous uh, public revolutions in Ukraine and Georgia, after which, like in Georgia, um, Brzezinski and Soros put their puppet, a guy, this guy, Sharkas Vali, on the, on, the, on the throne as president. He's, he's also fundamentally connected to this guy, Tony Resco, who's currently in jail for corruption. They, they, they did a land deal together, and he was one of the major funders of his political career. And he was put um, in jail for so controlling the political um, system of uh, Chicago that when business people wanted to do uh, business with the state, um, he was asking for them to pay him uh, a fee to allow them to, to, to do uh, work and business with the state when he officially had nothing to do with the state. He's in prison for it now. These are the kind of people Obama's uh, uh, around. Uh, this guy... Um, William Ayres, Bill Ayres, was, uh, as admitted, being involved in, in, in doing terrorist bombing uh, through a, uh, a group called the Weathermen um, a few uh, decades ago, back in the 60s it was, um, and uh, Obama's political career was started in this guy's house with another associate from the Weather Underground um, 
uh, that was back in the 60s uh, planting bombs um, in America. He's fundamentally connected to this organization called ACORN, which is now being uh, prosecuted by a stream of American states for producing f uh, fake um, uh, representations to, uh, for voting, voting registrations. Um, and of course, the people they were uh, falsely voting would be falsely voting for him. And he's fundamentally connected to them. It's a deeply corrupt organization. And appropriately, Obama is closely connected to it because he's actually a deeply corrupt man. Uh, that's why, that's how you prosper in Chicago. He goes with the territory. And the other thing, hey, I wonder if the Keystones are writing this down. You write this down because where I'm going to now. Around, because um, it's about time someone bloody said it. Um, There is a political system, I'm not talking about Jewish people, it's not the same thing. There is a political system orchestrated, created and controlled to this day by the Rothschilds called Zionism. It is a tyrannical system which has no mercy on anyone that gets in its way. The Obama administration and around Obama is awash with people who are of the Zionist persuasion. His chief of staff um, at the White House is Rahm Emanuel, who has served in the Israeli army... He's an American. What's going on? Um, and his father was um, uh, involved in a notorious terrorist group called Ergun, which, along with other terrorist groups, bombed Israel into existence in 1948. I don't think there is going to be fair play on American policy um, in the Middle East. I don't feel it. And I would, I would emphasize this because this is never publicized. Zionism is a political system. It is not a race. And there are many, many Zion, uh, uh, Jewish people, look at these alone, who fundamentally oppose Zionism. You know, it's like saying the Liberal Party in Australia is the American people. All right, it's a bit more than that, but it's along the same line. It is the Australian people. Or the Labour Party is, is the Australian people. No, it's not. It's a political um, system, a political belief. And what they've done brilliantly is to equate a political belief with a race. So when you challenge the political belief and what it does, you are called a racist. I don't care. It's about time somebody talked about this stuff and stopped being frightened of it. And if people realized Zionism is the creation of the Rothschild family, who are a major, major Illuminati family, along with many others, and interact with very closely, in many ways, with the Rockefellers. It was the Rothschilds who spent millions, six million uh, pounds back in the 50s to build the Knesset, the um, Israeli parliament. It was the Rothschilds who built the um, Supreme Court in uh, Jerusalem, with all its massive Illuminati symbolism, which is well um, uh, shown on the uh, internet. This is a fiefdom of the Rothschilds, and Zionism has caused more mayhem and strife for Jewish people as anybody else. Why is there no peace in Israel because Zion, for Jewish people as well as Palestinians? Because Zionism doesn't want it. That's why. Because there are plans to use Israel and use the Jewish people in Israel to um, uh, manifest a, a massive conflict which will lead to a third world war, which is what these guys are after. And Rahm Emanuel is the man who pulls the strings of uh, Barack Obama along with this guy, another Zionist, called David Axelrod. He was the guy that ran the whole of... Um, uh, masterminded the whole of the election campaign, both against Hillary Clinton and against John McCain, and it's Axelrod that is responsible for the words that appear on the teleprompter screens that Barack Obama reads. And he reads them so robot-like in terms of uh, not having a thought in his head that last week maybe 10 days ago, he thanked himself for inviting everybody to a reception because someone else's speech was on the teleprompter instead of his by mistake. 
It was. It was when the Irish Prime Minister was there on St. Patrick's Day. There, people are starting to call him the teleprompter president. It's so bloody obvious. That's why he never looks ahead. It's right, left, right, left. Because that's where the screens are. <laughs> Hello, Barack, over here. Sorry, I'm reading. <laughs> and this is why you're getting uh, the, the policy of um, Obama saying Palestinian refugees belong to their own state and do not have a literal right to return to Israel. He's talking about the people who fled, 800,000 of them, um, at the time of the, the, uh, the bombing uh, uh, Israel into existence in 1948 and have never allowed to become back to their own land. People forget about this. White phosphorus, pepper bombing, the most crowded piece of land on the planet, the Gaza Strip. We don't target civilians, we just bomb where they live. <laughs> Unbelievable. We're just protecting ourselves. No, no, it's a slaughter. And now I'm hearing, oh, there's a lot of anti-Israeli sentiment. Do you know something? I have a way around that. Stop slaughtering innocent people from the sky. Okay? End of story. And it will go away. And this is important. This is important for, 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 for what's planned to come. We now have a situation in Israel where the extreme of the extreme has taken the reins of power. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, he, he, he's talked about, these are his words uh, summarized, he wants a violent reoccupation of Gaza to liquidate its elected government. And he pledges to thwart the Iranian threat once and for all. He's now got this guy, um, Lieberman, as his foreign minister, and this man's so far right, he topples over, right? Um, <laughs> And he's got uh, Barak as the defense minister in this new government, and he was defense minister that oversaw the uh, pepper bombing of the Gaza Strip. And this is um, uh, Martin Van Creefeld. He's a, a, a well-known historian in Israel, and this is what he said publicly. We possess several hundred atomic warheads and rockets and can launch them at targets in all directions, perhaps even at Rome. Most European capitals are targets for our air force. We have the capability to take the world down with us, and I can assure you that that will happen before Israel goes under. They have a policy, have a policy of not saying if they've got nuclear weapons or they haven't. They just don't talk about it. And a guy called um, Mordecai Venunu, a wonderful Israeli man, um, went to jail for, I think it was 18 years, for exposing the fact publicly that they did have nuclear weapons. And now we've got this thing, oh, Iran's going to have nuclear weapons. What? The idea, and we're seeing it almost complete now, from the start was to drive out the Palestinian people, not be at uh, one with them, not share power with them, not share the land with them. The green bits are Palestinian land over the period of time up to the year 2000, and it's gone on since then, as uh, illegal settlements are um, uh, put in um, Palestinian land. And one of the people that lives in an illegal settlement is Lieberman. As an Australian newspaper said this week, he must be the only foreign minister in the world who doesn't actually live within the borders of his own country. And the Middle East policy in Obama's administration is by uh, Bilderberg, uh, George Mitchell, Bilderberg, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, by the notorious uh, uh, little Kissinger, Richard Holbrook, who um, played a major part in breaking up the former Yugoslavia in, in wars, etc., so it could be absorbed into NATO and the uh, European Union, which it is being now. Um, um, he's Bilderberg Group, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission. He's now in charge of Pakistan-Afghanistan policy. And this man, who is an arch-Zionist called Dennis Ross, he's now in charge of Iran policy. <laughs> um, what it's building to is a, um, an effort, and Brzezinski is behind this, among many others, to create a conflict out of the Middle East and in this area we're looking at, to uh, bring about a third world war. And the third world war will be, and this was, was, was been written about um, in, 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 in the past, that there were going to be three world wars to bring this new world order into, into being. A, new wo a, a war that would finish off the superpowers and bring the whole world under the uh, control of a world government which will then dictate to every country. And uh, 
the uh, personnel are in place. Uh, we're hearing, oh, he's a good guy because he's closing Guantanamo. Well, he's going to close it in a year. But as, I won't go through this because of time. But John Pilger here brilliantly um, exposes the fact that um, Barack Obama has actually fundamentally changed nothing. It's all rhetoric. As he said, um, the man of change is changing little. That ought to be front page news from Washington. But it isn't. And I have a golden rule with Obama. Um, Again, that Hitler quote, but I have a golden rule with Obama. Um, ignore the words and watch the actions. If you listen to the words, you can get caught that there's change going on and he's different. Watch the actions and you'll see that there is nothing. And just to, conf just to confirm that nothing has changed, there you go. <laughs> Where would world politics be without Bono, eh? Where would they be? So we have the secret agenda, and we have the movie, which is just explaining away the secret agenda. And uh, the money, finance, is fundamentally one of these problem, reaction, solutions that we are now um, uh, looking at. This crisis was brought about, engineered by n not least this guy, Alan Greenspan, who was head of the Federal Reserve, Central Bank of America, but actually it's a private cartel of banks, nothing to do with the government in truth. And from the end of the kind of Reagan administration, right through Father Bush, right through the two Clintons, and through most of Boy Bush, this guy was head of the Federal Reserve. And he led a campaign which was mirrored around the world because of this transnational corporation I'm talking about, um, which uh, took away all credible regulation on the banks and financial institutions doing what the hell they bloody liked. And it was um, purposely created to create enormous amounts of debt, and uh, you could be a monkey and get a mortgage at one point, and the idea was then, when the debt had reached massive proportions, unmanageable proportions, then you crash the system. Because what you want is a massive problem which you can then add endless solutions to, uh, including the introduction eventually, and we're going there, of a world central bank to dictate to all global finance. And that's what we've been doing all these years, watching the game and all the rest of it. We've just been pulled in on the fishing line um, to get in more and more debt so the control uh, system can play out. And this guy, Henry Paulson, who was Treasury Secretary when the crash happened during the end of the Bush administration, he came from Goldman Sachs uh, in 2006, and then um, as to save the banking system, to save the economy, uh, orchestrated vast amounts of money to end up in the coffers of Goldman Sachs. All this money has been uh, uh, fired at the banks, disappeared, it's not changed things um, in any credible uh, way, and um, again, business as usual. Bush justifying the, uh, giving the money to the banks. The government's top economists, experts, warned that without immediate action by Congress, America could slip into financial panic and a distressing scenario would unfold. More banks could fail, including some in your community. The stock market would drop even more, which would reduce the value of your retirement account. The value of your home could plummet. Foreclosures uh, would rise dramatically. And, and, and if you own a business or a farm, you'd find it harder and harder expensive to get credit. More businesses will close their doors and millions of Americans could lose their jobs. God bless America. Then Obama comes in, change, when he says, we want even more money at the banks. Economists across the spectrum have warned that if we don't act immediately, millions more jobs will be lost and national unemployment rates will approach double digits. More people will lose their homes and their health care and our nation will sink into a crisis that at some point may be unable to be reversed. Different mass, same face. Be afraid, be very afraid. The big bag monster's coming now that we've invented him economic crisis, and um, just, a, just a puppet. And his uh, economic uh, team, people like Larry Summers, uh, Paul Volcker, Tim Geithner, they're straight from the very institutions that created the crisis, and they've been placed in uh, positions to solve the crisis, which means giving more and more money to the banks that they represent, trillions of dollars. And they're talking about it being the, the, the uh, bigger crisis than the 1930s. In many ways, um, in, on many levels, that, I think that's, that's absolutely right. What they want, and I've been saying this since November now, what they want, are we two-thirds there, don't want to be the bringer of bad news, but you know, let's face it, 
was to crash the economy first of all and create a massive problem. Stage two is for those that have created the problem to come into government and hurl enormous amounts of cuckoo land money at the problem because what they wanted to do in stage two is empty the, the weapons of government to respond to the crisis. And once those weapons, those guns have been emptied in terms of response possibilities, then they want to crash it here and crash it in a way that there can be no government response. They want to create absolute chaos on so many levels so that the people say, save us, do something. And the do something will bring in this centralized, global, fascist, um, Orwellian state. This, as a result of it. Not just a financial crisis, they want wars as well. They want to, first of all, destroy America, because if you want a world government, then you can't have superpowers in the world that can say no to the world government financially and militarily. So as I've been saying for years now, what, peop what we're seeing in America is the using America to destroy America. It's being destroyed militarily because it's on, fighting on so many fronts. And financially, I was there for two months recently, that country is on the brink a financial catastrophe, not just a crisis, catastrophe uh, with what's going on there, which has not hit the public arena yet. And the other thing they want in problem, reaction, solution is people to riot and be violent in response to what's going on because then they've got a problem that they can offer the solution to, which is increases in the police state to meet the problem of violent reaction of the public to the problems they've created and also to justify putting people into these uh, uh, concentration camps, you can only call them, um, holding centers they're called, which exist all over the world, particularly in America, um, under an organization called FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Again, people uh, 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 around the conspiracy research world have been talking about this now for uh, 10 years, and it's coming to, to pass. And it, you know, I, I don't believe in violence. I, I will not be violent. I will not be violent. I don't care what the situation is. I do want to be violent. I'm not going to add my energy to that crap. But a lot of people would be in response to this. And to do that, you need to get rid of their guns. That's why when Hitler came in, he, he wanted to disarm the population because then a big problem of resistance had gone. It's Rahm Emanuel that is now leading the campaign in America to take away more and more guns from the population because he knows that an, an armed uh, population prepared to use them in certain situations makes them much more easy, difficult to control. But I would say this, Martin Luther King, the limitation of riots, moral questions aside, is that they cannot win and their participants know it. Hence, rioting is not revolutionary but reactionary because it invites defeat. It involves an emotional catharsis, but it must be followed by a sense of futility. And <clears throat> what we need is not to riot, not to be violent, not even to go in mass protests, so be my guest if people want to do that. But they're not frightened of protests, this, this gang. They're terrified of us not complying with our own enslavement. And when we stop doing that, they've lost their power. No violence necessary. They want us to be violent. Um, inside job, problem, reaction, solution, 9-11. Won't go into all that now, but it's been, it's been well documented. But another classic one. And interestingly, 1997, the Grand Chessboard, Brzezinski book, Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues, except in the circumstances of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. What was it, three years later, four years later? Thank you, massive external threat, which has justified so much. I love that, so David Dees is a great artist. Anything like this in this presentation comes from David Dees. Um, a brilliant uh, artist who uh, portrays real powerful statements in, in pictures like this. Jet fuel, that's a good one. These are buildings, by the way, um, in other parts of the world that burned incredibly more intensely than the Twin Towers, and none of them fell. That one seems to be falling, but it's not. It's the, it's the, the way the, the, the building is actually um, uh, built. There you go. There you go. Put that where I can see it. 
Okay, we're not doing bad. There you go. Reichstag fire, which um, Hitler did. Blame someone else for it, justified uh, the uh, takeover of the state as a result of it. Same thing, problem, reaction, solution. Again, um, Saddam Hussein was, was, was the guy, we're going to go into Iraq because of Saddam Hussein. This is Donald Rumsfeld, the defense secretary at the time of the invasion of Iraq, um, meeting Saddam Hussein in 1983 to arrange for Reagan Bush administration to um, ship chemical and biological weapons for use against the Iranians. Um, this is a an American mainstream newspaper report from 2002. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the US Defense Secretary and one of the most strident critics of Saddam Hussein, met the Iraqi president in 1983 to ease the way to US, for US companies to sell biological and chemical weapons, including anthrax and bubonic plague cultures, according to newly declassified government documents. But again and again, you see people creating the problem who then become the people to solve the problem. He was on the board of a, 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 a European engineering giant called ABB in 2000 when they sold nuclear equipment to North Korea. He then becomes defense secretary and says North Korea is a danger because it's got nuclear equipment. <laughs> Alongside uh, uh, problem, reaction, solution comes what I call the totalitarian tiptoe. Very simple. You're going there to Z, uh, to Z, but you're at A. And if you go in one leap, you know the change is going to be so vast, people are going to say, what's going on? So you go in as big a jump as you can, but you try not too big a jump that so many people will, will start to ask questions. And each jump is promoted and projected as unconnected to all the others. That's how the European Union, uh, a centralized dictatorship now, uh, was um, totalitarian tiptoed out of a free trade area. 75% um, of laws in Britain now originate in the European Union. And the European Union uh, pass a law, a British Parliament or any other European Parliament pass a law, doesn't matter, that one takes precedent. They want the same in uh, America with the North American Union, which Obama is going to be pushing. Fascism, you really think it would be this obvious. The stepping stone approach as what's got us this far where so many stepping stones have now been made that it is becoming obvious to anyone with a mind. I'll quickly go through this because uh, um, there's so much to get through, but I, it's like I say, I wish I had hours. The other um, uh, coordinate is to understand that they want people to be a believer. They want people to believe in something because once you have a belief system that is rigid, then you um, uh, become less of a problem. They want religious belief systems, political belief systems, racial belief systems, self-identity belief systems, anything that puts you in a prison of the mind. Because the, the, you, you'll then filter through this process of um, the way the neurons fire in the brain, you will filter reality through the belief system. Religions. Um, in the end, um, religions are invariably, the major religions are worshipping the same force. It's not uh, explained like that, but that's what goes on. Again, out of Atlantis and Lemuria and then those civilizations that, that followed, um, the worshipping of um, uh, the moon goddess and the sun god, the worshipping of the moon and the sun, was prevalent. And it uh, manifested in various um, religions, uh, not least from this part of the world, which if you think about it, is the religion factory. Christianity, um, Islam, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, all came out of this part of the world, these major religions. And when you strip them down... They are invariably sun and moon um, worshipping religions. So in Babylon, they worshipped the uh, Queen Semiramis, the sun goddess. Uh, Nimrod, known as, so known as Baal or Bel, the, the, the sun god. And Tammuz, who was the sun, the virgin-born son of the moon goddess and the sun god. Um, Tammuz later became known as Jesus in the Christian stories. Um, and when this Babylonian uh, trinity... Uh, was taken to Rome as the bloodlines moved to Rome and, and founded the Christian church. Um, they changed uh, the names, but basically the same religion um, remained. Um, this is the, uh, a depiction of the uh, moon goddess and the sun god, the star, the sun there, which is an original uh, depiction from Ur in what is now Iraq, Sumer Babylon, from 2000 B.C., and this is the international symbol of um, Islam to this day. Um, when you get deeper into it, these are all different masks, again, on the same face of the moon and sun religions. This is Mormonism. In America, again, 
the sun and moon symbolism is all over uh, their, um, their, their symbols in the Salt Lake City, etc. So when you see Mother Mary and Jesus, what you're looking at is a depiction of Queen Semiramis, the goddess of Babylon, and Nimrod um, stroke Tamos because they said that um, Nimrod, um, when he died, became the sun god Baal and impregnated Semiramis with the rays of the sun. That's where the virgin birth comes from. And she gave birth to the reincarnation of Nimrod, uh, which became known as Tamus. And that's why in Christianity they talk about father and son being one because that comes from the Babylonian uh, uh, symbolism of that. That's where Isis, uh, the virgin mother of Egypt, and Horus... Uh, the sun in Egypt comes from. It's the same recurring themes. And all across the world, the mother, the virgin mother, and the baby religions um, follow. And they all come from the same source. And because they pro pro project it in a different way, people think that they're different religions, but they're the same basic religion. Consciousness, I mean, this is, this is the point I would stress. Consciousness doesn't do religion. Mind does religion and this is an this is an ancient depiction of queen semiramis the goddess of babylon and i think i've seen her somewhere else before the statue of liberty a mirror depiction of queen semiramis was given to new york by french freemasons in paris who knew exactly what it represented the goddess of babylon and there you go and there's uh the a mirror image of the Statue of Liberty on an island in the River Seine in Paris to this day. Uh, the goddess of the French Republic, same thing. The goddess Freedom on the top of the uh, Capitol building, same thing. The goddess Columbia, the goddess of the District of Columbia, same thing. Um, in the Vatican, because of course the, the, the Roman church is the Church of Babylon relocated and they use different names for the same stories, um, they depicted uh, Semiramis in Babylon as a dove, and of course Nimrod was the sun, and this is, you see in the Vatican, the dove and the sun, that's Semiramis and, uh, and, uh, and Nimrod, it's the same thing. So um, Nimrod was the sun god, and you see him all over the place as well. The symbol of, of Nimrod in Babylon was the, the flame or the lighted torch, and that's why the Statue of Liberty is holding a lighted torch, the torch of Nimrod, and he's actually standing, when you see from above, on a depiction of the sun. It's, and, and that, you see, the way they manipulate reality and sense of reality, Americans, understandably, look to the Statue of Liberty as a symbol of their freedom when it's a symbol of their enslavement. Same thing, holding Nimrod. And this is an exact and massive depiction of the flame held by the Statue of Liberty, and that's on top of the Pont d'Alma Tunnel, and that's now where people take their tributes to Princess Diana, who died underneath it. Another, another way that Nimrod was depicted was as Dagon, the fish god. This is an original depiction uh, from uh, thousands of years ago, and that's just a, a kind of, obviously, a knocked-up um, symbol of it. And that's why we have this. Dagon, the fish god, the mitre, it's all the same symbolism of um, symbolizing Nimrod. The, the obelisks you find all over the place, the biggest obelisk in the world is the Washington Memorial opposite the White House. That's the penis of Nimrod Osiris, going back to that symbolism of the Credo uh, necklace too. Nimrod aircraft, all the same things. And the religions were taken across the world and expanded, and they became the religious network that we have today, which f ironically fight each other when actually they're all different masks on the same face, which ultimately connect into the same network. And same with the New Age. So much of the New Age is just the same manipulation. I call the New Age the last cul-de-sac before the gold mine. People... People who've rejected mainstream religion have re rejected this world is all there is science and are looking into things of vibration and stuff like that and spirituality in another way. You've got to stop them get into the gold mine. So you want a cul-de-sac to get them into and it's become known as the, the new age. And they also worship. And again, anything to do with this network is always, reptilian brain, hierarchical. And so we have hierarchical structures of power within the new age um, 
uh, structure of beings and entities and great white brotherhoods. It's all hierarchy. Consciousness doesn't do hierarchy. Mind does hierarchy. If you're into hierarchy, you're in mind, you're not in consciousness. Simple things. You can see whether it's conscious or not. And I, I love that the New Age Jesus, Sananda, looks exactly like the, the Jesus depicted by the Renaissance painters who hadn't got a clue what he bloody looked like anyway. <laughs> so the idea is to use religion to keep people in mind and stop them connecting to consciousness. Because when you start talking about consciousness and the way consciousness sees the world, religions go, you can't say that, that's the devil. And all the rest of it. And fright people into... Um, uh, uh, acquiescing to rules and regulations of these religions. And again, in the end, all these religions, you go through them and you're providing sustenance, energetic sustenance for the same entities. The same entities. It's a very true saying. Energy goes where, where attention goes and worship is a really focused form of attention. And so when we are in worship, focusing on a deity... We might think the deity represents something, but it represents something else. Attention goes where, or energy flows where attention goes. 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 I mean, what an image for a religion to focus on. Someone being tortured. What are we doing? Think, let's think about it. What an image to focus a religion on. And like I say, religion is mind. That's why it's so uh, uh, schism-like, fractured. And they create them so they can play them off against each other. Trust Jesus. We know the truth. No, Judaism knows the truth. No, uh, Islam knows the truth. No, this knows the truth. Play them off against each other. It's a divide and rule to put people in so many ways in that state. Religion has played a massive, massive uh, part in this, cutting off the channels to consciousness. Um, oh, gold. I wish I had lots of time. Okay. Coordinate. Secret society network and the religions worship the same gods because the same force controls the secret society network that controls the religions ultimately. So you have the eye of um, Ra, which you see over and over again in the symbolism of the secret societies and the corporations they control. Um, again, that's, the, that's a, in the Vatican. There you see um, uh, the uh, Freemasonry thing. And that's in a Freemason's lodge in, in Boston. Same thing, it's the rising sun. This is the head, supreme headquarters of the 33rd degree in Washington, D.C., just down from the White House. And again, the rising sun symbol of the Illuminati and the secret society network. And that's why above the Downing Street door, you have that symbol, which is the symbol of the rising sun. We control Downing Street. That's the uh, sun chair of George Washington, the first president of the United States, a high Freemason, and again, the same symbolism. And that's what you get on NBC News. That's the symbolism of that. That's the sun on a, a Boston Freemasonry Lodge. Worship of the sun. This is the um, Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in London, from which um, Freemasonry went out across the uh, colonies, Australia and America and all the rest of it, and they located it in Great Queen Street, which was one of the names in Babylon for Queen Samiramis, the moon goddess, great queen. And so when they uh, created Virginia, and they said it was named after the virgin queen, Queen Elizabeth I, who was no more a virgin than Madonna, by the way, um, <laughs> it's just a cover story. Virginia was named after the virgin queen of Babylon, Samiramis. And this is how they do it, by having these pyramids within uh, pyramids, which mirror the secret society structure of levels of degree. And in the end, these secret societies uh, that we know, like Freemasons and all, all these others, they feed a very chosen select few into another pyramid that is never talked about and is denied to exist, um, which is where the real action is, what I call the Illuminati pyramid, pyramid, and that's where the real action and, and power is. You can also symbolize it as a spider's web. The spider at the center is where the control system comes out of. You never see that. You never see those people. And in the end, they connect into these other dimensions of reptilian entities. Each of these strands represents an organization. 
The closer the strand is, the organization is to the spider, the more exclusive it is. And often if you get close enough to the spider, it doesn't even have a name because it's very difficult to um, lock into something that doesn't have a name. As you come out, you're starting to hit things like Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, which interact directly with mainstream society. But it, all of these organizations, they get their orders and agenda from the spider, and so they work as one unit. And they've done that to the world as a result. The, uh, the Jesuits um, are a major um, spider, uh, close to the spider organization. That's the, the black pope, as they call him, the head of the Jesuits currently, Adolfo Nicholas, who more power than the real pope. And so many politicians like these people from Pierre Trudeau in Canada and Robert Mugabe in Clinton and these other people, John Kerry, are connected into the Jesuits. So is this guy, Joe Biden, the vice president currently. Another major secret societies are the, um, the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem here, which is now known today as the uh, Knights of Malta and uh, have their headquarters in Rome. These are the Knights Templar and they, uh, they control the city of London financial district and uh, create mayhem as a result. And this is the, the temple area where they, they control law from, and this is the original Templar church that was made famous recently by the uh, Da Vinci Code. And um, also, the Illuminati connect into Satanism. Uh, that's why so many of these famous people in the world um, take part in satanic ritual and human sacrifice and all this stuff, because these bloodlines have right the way through history, and they keep going and doing it. At one time, they did it openly when they could, but now it's done extremely covertly and through this secret society network that it connects into, but it has its own structure also. And what they're doing is creating... Uh, oh, this guy, Vlad Dracul, by the way, uh, who is famous for... Um, uh, spearing people and uh, impaling people and drinking their blood um, back, I think it was the 15th century, in what is now Romania. Uh, and he was the inspiration of the, uh, the Dracula stories. And he was a, and his family were key members of an organization called the Royal Court of the Dragon, or the Order of the Dragon, which actually goes back to, to ancient Egypt, at least to ancient Egypt. And um, this guy's uh, sister... Um, comes through directly um, to the uh, Mary of Tech, um, who is the present Queen of England's grandmother. Um, she is a direct descendant of Vlad Dracul's sister. Um, and uh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Things like this is kind of from a B movie and all this stuff that you see, this actually goes on. Um, one of the things that has, and, and you, you see it um, all around the world in uh, history and often connected to dragons, but not always. Um, the thing that, that uh, I found uh, one of the hardest things to cope with originally when I came across it is not just that children are sacrificed in these rituals by these famous people and lots of not so famous people, um, or that child abuse is, is, um, is going on. What staggered me is the scale of it. It is extraordinary. And sometimes um, it's depicted too close to the truth, like in this uh, Stanley Kubrick movie, Eyes Wide Shut, where he understated it, actually. Uh, but he included in this movie, and he died, actually, very soon after it was, uh, it was seen by the um, powers that be of a heart attack. Um, and I know from a someone who's writing a biography of Stanley Kubrick in America that 15 minutes of it were, were removed after he died. So what did that, uh, that say? These um, rituals with the, the, the rich and famous in the stately homes and other places are not going on every now and again here and there. They're going on all over the world, including Australia. And my understanding is Victoria is one of the centers for it in uh, Australia, and it involves some very well-known people um, in this area, um, as it does everywhere, because this, this, this is a global thing. And what, one of the things they're doing in these rituals, and I've talked to people who've taken part in them, often against their will, what they're doing is um, they're, they're, bringing, they're creating an energy um, bridge between the entities, the reptilian entities and other entities that operate just outside visible light, the, the, the rituals are there to create an energetic bridge which allows them to enter this dimension and be seen and to be interacted with. And one of the ways is that symbol you see in uh, Satanism, which is the, um, 
the pentagram with a circle around it and other symbols because we see them as symbols, but they have an effect on the energy field. If you could see it on an energetic level, you would see something very different that that symbol is, uh, geometrical symbol is creating. And it's through these symbols that they bring them through energetically into this uh, dimension and interact with them. And the hierarchy of Satanism, hierarchy of Illuminati, is based on the, the, the power of the demonic entities, as people call them, that you allow to take over your, your body. This is where the whole thing comes from of selling your soul to the devil. You, you get the power and the prestige within this world up to a point, but you give yourself over to these demonic entities um, be, uh, before you get that power. And then after you pass through, you become controlled by these entities when you leave the body. Now, this is in Sydney. I found this years ago, I dropped off my seat. This is a war memorial for the people who died in the two world wars, and this is the symbol in the middle of it, someone being sacrificed over an image of the sun. This symbolism is all over the place, Bohemian Grove, where they worship a 40-foot stone owl, which is symbolic of Queen Semiramis. This is a, um, uh, a, a, an original Babylonian depiction of Queen Semiramis, and she's famous for being connected to owls. And uh, there you have an owl on the street plan around the um, uh, Capitol building in Washington. And if you look at a, another level of it, it's standing in the street plan on a pyramid. Uh, and this is symbolic of Queen Semiramis with the Capitol building, American politics in its belly. And like I say, this is a global thing. This is Canberra with the Capitol building at the top, the Parliament building at the top, because the same force is controlling this country as is controlling America and Britain and all of them. So they use the same symbolism if you look for it. And these people, famous people, top people in banking, business, politics, presidents, um, go to Bohemian Grove in Northern California and worship this stone owl, Semiramis. You couldn't make it up. This is um, a picture from Bohemian Grove in 1957. That's a guy called Glenn Seaborg who developed plutonium. Cheers, Glenn. Um, and there, at the time, 1957, is a B-movie actor called Ronald Reagan. And here's a career politician uh, called Richard Nixon just about to take Kennedy on in the 1960 election. Both Bohemian Grove members and both go on to be presidents of the United States, no matter what their background. Presidents, like in every other country, are not selected by ballot, they are or elected by ballot, they're selected by blood and by uh, Illuminati and networks. It's amazing that this is, as this is David D's uh, uh, picture sim symbolizing the force behind it, but it's amazing that it's actually based on truth. And the reason it doesn't come out is because through the secret society network, they put their people in the key places in social services, the key places in police, the key places in coroner's offices and, and, and medical staff and all the rest of it. And they can then decide if, if things are uh, investigated or prosecuted or just shut down. And that's why it never comes out, because they've stitched the whole system up. Okay. The agenda today. Where are we? Okay. The agenda today. This is where we're going. They want um, a global, centrally controlled fascist dictatorship, that um, network that I, and structure I've just been talking about. And they want a microchip population connected to a global computer. And the microchip is, is designed not just as electronic tagging, but to get access to the biological computer system to externally manipulate the way we think and our emotional state as well as physical state. And if we think that uh, the, the robotic... Uh, People are from the past like the Nazis. Well, this is China waiting for work in the morning. That's what they want to turn people into. In, in many ways, the Nazi and the Chinese situation is a blueprint for how they want the world to, um, to look when this new world order is in place. Pyramids of manipulation, this is how they do it and through all that and secret agenda. They want a super state agenda. I talked about that. Um, European Union is the first one, and the European Union, is, Europe itself, is named after Europa, and Europa is another word uh, name for Queen Semiramis, and around the goddess, whether it's the Egyptian goddess or the Christian goddess that comes from Semiramis, are 12 stars, symbolically, going back um, thousands of years, and that's where the 12 stars of the European Union come from. They're the 12 stars of the, the moon goddess of Babylon, and... Um, 
Europa is depicted with uh, the bull, who is symbolic of Nimrod, and on a coin in 2005 came out of the European Union, you had Europa and the bull, Nimrod and Semiramis. At the inner sanctum of all these organizations, they know exactly what they're doing. This is the Habsburg family, Otto von Habsburg, uh, one of the major Illuminati families, and he was the one that started the pan-Europa movement that created the European Union ultimately. They want to break Europe up into regions. Some maps have come out. Um, same in America. They, this is a map from the Nixon um, era where they showed America broken up into regions. And watch this in Australia. What the idea is to sell it to people as devolving power, like to the states or the regions or groups of states, devolving power, giving power to the people. The real reason is to break up the nation state so that there's no unified response to the edifice of power above the super states uh, that they want. And of course, this has now moved, this centralization of power has moved so quickly and reached such a point, we have a name for it, globalization. Globalization is what? It's exactly the agenda I've been talking about all these years, the centralization of power in every area of our lives. And we have people of the left, and good luck to them, who protest against you know, global injustice and the um, World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and all the rest of it. But what they don't seem to realize, because they reject and often lambast people like me, is all these different things they're protesting about is actually the same force under different names. And it's not just, as they seem to think, greedy corporations seeking more and more power. The corporations are not the origin of globalization. They are the vehicle for it, that's all. The origin is in the hidden uh, forces behind the corporations that so many of the left uh, refuse to accept exist. The idea is to make every part of the world dependent on every other part of the world so self-sufficiency and self-government and control of our own lives and communities becomes impossible. That's what globalization is about. Free trade is the freedom to exploit. It's the freedom of corporations to make their products for a few cents on the dollar, paying uh, starvation wages, and they bring them across the world without tariff barriers and get the biggest price they can in another part of the world. It's called free trade, freedom to exploit. But you can't be against free trade. Oh, you can. Watch me. And so all these organizations are eventually controlled by the same force. And this guy is a front man for taking it to the next level. That's why I keep calling him the used car salesman, because his role is one and one alone. Sell the agenda to the people. And so the idea is to put us in these jails of uh, control, homeland security, military dictatorship. This is um, Adolf Hitler selling the Gestapo, the creation of the Gestapo. An evil exists that threatens every man, woman, and child of this great nation. We must take steps to ensure un our domestic security and protect our homeland. That's exactly what they said after 9-11 to justify um, homeland security and the police state. All over the place you find now cameras and surveillance. Um, this is a Poster after the London bombings, secure beneath watchful eyes on London transport, closed circuit television cameras, we're protecting you. This is from Nazi Germany, 1934. Same bloody thing. Yeah, walls have ears, we're listening to you, we're watching you. Oh, this is a lovely one. Sheffield bus station in Britain. It's a bus station. You go there, you get on a bus, you go home. Community bus station. Poster. Spit and run. You'll still get caught DNA. Every bus, tram, and interchange has DNA testing kits. Spit at the staff and you can be traced and prosecuted. Even if we don't know what you look like and your records will be on the national DNA database forever. And so in every country we're now seeing, because it's a movement, we're seeing the difference between the military and the police becoming less and less obvious. People being asked to um, spy on their neighbors and their friends. Hey, this guy, this guy Ike is in Melbourne and he's, he's inciting people to discord. You gotta get around here fast. <laughs> We're on our way. <laughs> 
This is how to tell a terrorist now, the airport. <laughs> you know. And so we got uh, the movement towards uh, microchips and uh, identity cards and all that stuff. And this is a State Watch report in, um, in Europe, uh, an organization ex just explaining how the cumulative um, nature of all these things I'm talking about uh, are, are turning us into a police state very, very quickly. And the idea is to keep prodding us telling us what to do, telling us what we can't do, making it difficult to do this, making it difficult to do that, and um, watching us and having punishments for whatever we bloody do. Um, keep quiet, shut up, you can't say that. Oh, no, go to a free speech zone and all the rest of it. And cumulatively, again, this is what it's about. And this is why we mustn't acquiesce to it. They have experiments in laboratories where... They have rats or mice, and they have these mazes. And if you go down this part of the maze, there's an electronic shock equipment, and you go down there, and the mouse gets shocked. After a few times, it's been shocked so often, you can take the uh, equipment away so it can freely go without actually any shock. It will not go down there, because its mind has been through punishment, through hassle, um, and pain has been uh, programmed not to go down there, only to go down this channel or that channel. And what's happening is that we are now, all over the world, being bombarded with so much um, instruction, so many orders, no many, so many can't do's, so many punishments for the ridiculously small things that they're basically prodding us so that we go into a state of acquiescence and subordination and just follow unquestioningly the diktats of authority. That's what it's about. It's about programming us through all these um, uh, consequences that are now emerging by the day at ridiculous uh, levels of detail in our lives. We mustn't acquiesce to that. This is what this is about, the taser, which is coming in all over the world and 55,000 um, volts of electricity, uh, which has killed a, a, a significant number of people around the world. And I saw a newspaper headline when these first came out in America, and it was written by this journalist who'd seen it happen, and the headline was, anything you say, officer, just don't use that thing on me. That's what they're here for. People say, oh, it's bad for the taser, people are dying. No, no, it's good for the taser, people are dying. Because when you've seen people dying from a taser, someone pulls a taser out with a uniform on, you're going to do whatever he says. That's the idea. It's the laboratory mouse, the laboratory rat. Political um, uh, correctness is another thing. Not only uh, you know, are, are we uh, physically being uh, uh, given consequences for everything, we now, well, we, well, I, well, I don't, but many, many people do, they um, are thinking what they say before they say it. They're not even having the freedom and the relaxation to say what they think in terms, in, in case they say something that's politically incorrect. You know, and people say, uh, oh no, you can't say people are crippled, you have to say they're digitally challenged. <laughs> well... I've got rheumatoid arthritis in my hands, and I can hardly use them for anything but driving and pressing buttons on a computer. Uh, I don't mind if someone says I've got a crippled hand. I have no problem with that, because it bloody well is, okay? I mean, what's the, what's the problem? But it's, it's all about, um, uh, and again, you know, the, the text language is the same. If you think on the level of mind, we think with words. When you have a thought, you're thinking in words. The more over the generations you can remove and reduce the number of words that we use, you eventually do not even have the words to um, construct a thought with any detail. It's all blandness. And this is what Orwell talked about with his old speak and new speak where the uh, authorities in 1984 wanted to replace more and more of the old words that, had, that you could express yourself in detail with and replace them with new speak, which were bland and had no real meaning. And if you get to that stage, and that's where they're heading, you know, this text speak, you are, and all this stuff, we're not even going to have the language, not far from now, as the generations move on, that can actually have the words to articulate a thought of any detail except a bland one. That's the idea. It's all a mind game. Well, I love this one. This is a politically correct sign. 
Caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. And it says at the bottom, also, the bridge is out ahead. <laughs> so this is what we're looking at. Yeah, who's word in your head? Programming the computer. They want the microchip to program the computer. That's why they're uh, pushing this um, uh, around the world. Um, microchip your children so you know where they are. Put your medical records on a microchip. But the idea of the microchip, like I say, is to access the body computer and manipulate it from within. Um, and uh, the media is uh, fundamentally a part of the mind control also that's, um, whose world is in your head all the time as they manipulate our reality. And it's the same with uh, like the media, as I say, and uh, the way that they do this. Now, computer access. They're trying to access the computer in many, many different ways. And uh, when you kind of realize how the computer works, you start to realize why they're doing what they're doing. All this crap in food is to destabilize the computer electrochemically. The body computer on one level is an electrochemical entity, organism. And it has need to have a certain chemical and electrical balance to function mentally, emotionally, and physically in its optimum state. So what they're doing now is um, bombarding us, and have been for some time, especially young people, children, with all this electrochemical crap to destabilize the body computer and its uh, um, receiver transmission levels so that we are operating on a fraction of our potential. Same with the drugs that they're throwing at uh, people, not least the children. So many of these people, these kids that go crazy with guns, almost all of them in the end turn out to be um, drugged up with this stuff. Aspartame, the... Uh, Sugar substitute um, is a brain suppressant and rewirer, which was brought onto the market as head of cell pharmaceuticals by this guy, Donald Rumsfeld, who keeps coming up in many guises, who sold out for a fortune to Monsanto, who now own Aspartame. Fluoride, that lady Anna Bly up in Queensland is putting uh, fluoride in the Queensland water. They put it in the water of concentration camps in Germany to suppress and make docile the inmates. Fluoride is a brain suppressant. Monsanto, again, comes up again and again. The home of genetically modified food. Why? Because it's to genetically modify us. Genetically modified food affects human DNA. And I'll give you an example of, of just how... I'll give you an example of just how detailed this is, because what it comes down to on so many levels is there is a level of knowledge here about how everything works, and then there's a level of knowledge that the public are allowed to have. I'll tell you a story I came across um, only last week. We have a, uh, um, a, 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 a treatment for cancer called chemotherapy, which is equivalent for most people to assisted suicide. Stone Age medicine. What chemotherapy does, as we are at the cutting edge of, of knowledge, is uh, kills cells. That's what it does. It kills cells. It doesn't kill cancer cells only. It kills all cells. And the question is, do we kill enough healthy cells to kill the patient before we've killed the cancer cells to rid of the cancer? So what they're doing now is, um, some people anyway, they're trying to find drugs or a biomarker that will put into cancer cells which will only uh, attract the drug and the healthy cells won't. What it turns out, actually, this guy, Professor Dan Burke and, uh, in, in Britain, as established, is that cancer cells already have a biomarker and have always had a biomarker and he's called it CYP1B1. It is an enzyme that only appears in cancer cells and not healthy cells. What he then did was get with another man, Professor Potter at Leicester University, who came up with a substance found in many fruit and vegetables, which is called salvestrols. That's what they call it. And they found this. The CYP1B1 enzyme, only in cancer cells, interacts with salvestrols that we get from fruit and vegetables and turns it into a cancer-killing agent. So we have had a natural cancer response system. As long as we eat 
fruit and vegetables in rich numbers with these salvestrols in them. When we get a cancer cell, the CYP1B1 enzyme within the cancer cell, but not in the healthy one, creates a chemical reaction with the salvestrols and kills the cancer cell and doesn't harm normal cells. You get salvestrols in those fruit and vegetables that are subject to fungal attack because the salvestrols are what the fruit and vegetables produce to deal with a fungus attack. And the reason salvestrols work against cancer, because we're going to find out, and it's going to be uh, established eventually, cancer is actually a form of fungal attack on the body. Now, this is where I'm going. In the 1950s, they introduced chemical farming. From the 1950s, we have had an epidemic of cancer in the Western world. So what is the effect of this? Because they've been using fungicides on fruit and vegetables, they've been killing the funguses and the fungal attacks artificially, which means the, pl the fruit and vegetable plants are no longer producing salvestrols to, to, to deal with the fungal attack because it's being done externally for them. But here's the killer that they, they know what they're doing. The most used fungicides used in the world have another effect. They neutralize the effect of CYP1B1, the enzyme in cancer cells. So you can eat all the salvestrols you like, but if your body accumulates the fungicide poisons through eating these foods, it won't matter anyway because the salvestrol will not be activated as a cancer-killing agent because the enzyme within the cancer cell has been neutralized. And after 20 years of research of these people, that is absolutely no accident. They know exactly what they're doing. And that's why in America now, this bill um, is going through to make it virtually impossible for people to produce organic food in America when this bill goes through. Because if you eat organic fruit and vegetables of this type, then you have, you, they are rich in salvestrols because they're still producing them to fight off fungal attack because there's no fungicide getting in the way. Vaccines. 25 vaccines by the age of two. A emerging, uh, growing immune system gets attacked with that shite in that period of time and we think that children are going to grow into adults with immune systems that are as effective as they could be, you're having a bloody laugh. And these uh, things that vaccines were supposed to get rid of were in free fall between the before the vaccines came in. Another scam. And, of course, the immune system is the antivirus system. If that's not working, we become open to endless other attacks, which is what chemotherapy does in cancer treatment. It kills the cells in the immune system, which is why people that have chemotherapy have um, shot immune systems that open to other things. And so there's also a, an attack going on now, as we've seen through this uh, um, organization trying to um, reduce the doses and the sources of food supplements and stuff. It's all an attack. This guy, uh, Codex Alimentarius, um, which is trying to uh, create... Um, regulations that basically make uh, food supplements and other things a waste of time because of the doses and the, the uh, quality of them. And Codex Alimentarius came out of the people behind the IG Farben chemical cartel, pharmaceutical cartel that was behind the Auschwitz concentration camps and much more. And this guy, Fritz Tamir, who was jailed by the Nuremberg trials for seven years for war crimes and was got out after four thanks to Nelson Rockefeller, his friend in America, um, he was the man with others in the 1960s that set up Codex Alimentarius, which is now um, uh, trying to destroy our ability to um, bridge the gap between what we used to get from fruit and vegetables and food and we don't get now. It's mass culling of the population. That's what they're after. And international law, international regulations is the way they're doing it. The reason international law is the, now, is the code word that you, or term that you see all the time now is because if you want a world government dictatorship, you have to have laws that everyone on the planet obeys and has to obey. That's where your dictatorship comes from. And that's why international law, international regulations are coming up everywhere. Same with this electromagnetic uh, soup that we live in now. It's attacking the body electromagnetically uh, and electrically to stop us um, 
uh, operating on the level that we can. Before we have a break, I'll just finish with this because this is so, so important. Um, the carbon con. We are being sold one of the most blatant lies, at least of modern times, and probably more than that. In this network, you'll see the Club of Rome, started in 1968. The Club of Rome is there to, within the network to manipulate the environmental movement to advance this agenda of global centralization. This is the um, founder of the Club of Rome, Ulio Pecci, quoted in one of its own publications in 1991. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. And that is what they have done. The greenhouse effect. Oh, it doesn't let heat out, so the planet warms, and it's, it's the greenhouse gases, and it's, come, it's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has become the enemy, the villain. Without car well, carbon dioxide, first of all, in the greenhouse effect, the planet would be too cold for any life, and nothing would bloody grow without carbon dioxide, and we've turned it into the great bloody evil. And the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere... Um, in, in, in relationship to other greenhouse gases is fractional, and the amount produced by human uh, 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 technology is a tiny, tiny fraction of that fraction. The idea that it's changing the climate of the planet is insane. Talking of which, <laughs> I've learned many things in the last 20 years, and I've learned this. If Al Gore's involved, it's a scam. End of story. Of course they give him the Oscar for his rubbish, ludicrous documentary. Of course he gets the Nobel bloody priest prize, because the people that want this thing out there control who gets those things. And we have, oh, you know, if it's a scam, Madonna's singing on the bloody stage as well, it seems to me. This is the, um, the, 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 the great earth concerts around the world, selling a lie. These people do no research. And here's the global warming survival handbook for those live earth concerts written by David de Rothschild. <laughs> you know, computers have a, 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 a common kind of theme all over the world. Shite in, shite out. That's what computer models are, right? If you put rubbish data in, you're going to get ridiculous data out, and that's what these climate models are. And the idea is to scam us into a state of survival and a state of giving our power away, uh, more and more taxation, more and more international law to dictate to us what we can and cannot do on the basis of saving the planet. New world order to save the earth. The earth don't need saving. If you mess with it too much, you kick your butt off it. No need saving. Bigger than you are. Do you know, um, do you know, do you know sometimes when I go outside and it's cloudy and the clouds move and the sun comes out, it gets warmer. Have you noticed that? 